chapter one of the fathers of the constitution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the fathers of the constitution by max ferrand chapter one treaty of peace the united states of america it was in the declaration of independence that this name was first and formally proclaimed to the world and to maintain its verity the war of the revolution was fought americans liked to think that they were then assuming among the powers of the earth the equal and independent station to which the laws of nature and of nature's god entitled them and in view of their subsequent marvellous development they are inclined to add that it must have been before an expectant world in these days of prosperity and national greatness it is hard to realize that the achievement of independence did not place the united states on a footing of equality with other countries and that in fact the new state was more or less an unwelcome member of the world family it is nevertheless true that the latest comer into the family of nations did not for a long time command the respect of the world this lack of respect was partly due to the character of the american population along with the many estimable and excellent people who had come to british north america inspired by the best of motives there had come others who were not regarded favorably by the governing classes of europe discontent is frequently a healthful sign and a forerunner of progress but it makes one an uncomfortable neighbor in a satisfied and conservative community and discontent was the underlying factor in the migration from the old world to the new in any composite immigrant population such as that of the united states there was bound to be a large element of undesirables among those who came for conscience's sake were the best type of religious protestants but there were also religious cranks from many countries of almost every conceivable sect and of no sect at all many of the newcomers were poor it was common too to regard colonies as inferior places of residence to which objectionable persons might be encouraged to go and where the average of the population was lowered by the influx of convicts and thousands of slaves the great number of emigrants from europe wrote Thirio, saxon commissioner of commerce to america from philadelphia in seventeen eighty four has filled this place with worthless persons to such a degree that scarcely a day passes without theft robbery or even assassination it would perhaps be too much to say that the people of the united states were looked upon by the rest of the world as only half civilized but certainly they were regarded as of lower social standing and of inferior quality and many of them were known to be rough uncultured and ignorant great britain and germany maintained american missionary societies not as might perhaps be expected for the benefit of the indian or negro but for the poor benighted colonists themselves and great britain refused to commission a minister to her former colonies for nearly ten years after their independence had been recognized it is usually thought that the dregs of humiliation have been reached when the rights of foreigners are not considered safe in a particular country so that another state insists upon establishing therein its own tribunal for the trial of its citizens or subjects yet that is what the french insisted upon in the united states and they were supposed to be especially friendly they had had their own experience in america first a native indian had appealed to their imagination then at an appropriate moment they seemed to see in the americans a living embodiment of the philosophical theories of the time they thought that they had at last found the natural man of rousseau and voltaire they believed that they saw the social contract theory being worked out before their very eyes nevertheless in spite of this interest in americans the french looked upon them as an inferior people over whom they would have liked to exercise a sort of protectorate to them the americans seemed to lack a proper knowledge of the amenities of life commissioner Theriot, describing the administration of justice in the new republic noticed that a frenchman with the prejudices of his country and accustomed to court sessions in which the officers have imposing robes and a uniform that makes it impossible to recognize them smiles at seeing in the court-room men dressed in street clothes simple often quite common he is astonished to see the public enter and leave the court-room freely those who prefer even keeping their hats on later he adds it appears that the court of france wished to set up a jurisdiction of its own on this continent for all matters involving french subjects france failed in this but at the very time that peace was under discussion congress authorized franklin to negotiate a consular convention ratified a few years later according to which the citizens of the united states and the subjects of the french king in the country of the other 
should be tried by their respective consuls or vice-consuls though this agreement was made reciprocal in its terms and so saved appearances for the honor of the new nation nevertheless in submitting it to congress john jay clearly pointed out that it was reciprocal in name rather than in substance as there were few or no americans in france but an increasing number of frenchmen in the united states such was the status of the new republic in the family of nations when the time approached for the negotiation of a treaty of peace with the mother country the war really ended with the surrender of cornwallis at yorktown in seventeen eighty one yet even then the british were unwilling to concede the independence of the revolted colonies this refusal of recognition was not merely a matter of pride a division and a consequent weakening of the empire was involved to avoid this great britain seems to have been willing to make any other concessions that were necessary the mother country sought to avoid disruption at all costs but the time had passed when any such adjustment might have been possible the americans now flatly refused to treat of peace upon any footing except that of independent equality the british being in no position to continue the struggle were obliged to yield and to declare in the first article of the treaty of peace that his britannic majesty acknowledges the said united states to be free sovereign and independent states with france the relationship of the united states was clear and friendly enough at the time the american war of independence had been brought to a successful issue with the aid of france in the treaty of alliance which had been signed in seventeen seventy eight had been agreed that neither france nor the united states should without the consent of the other make peace with great britain more than that in seventeen eighty one partly out of gratitude but largely as a result of clever manipulation of factions in congress by the french minister in philadelphia the chevalier de la luzerne the american peace commissioners had been instructed to make the most candid and confidential communications upon all subjects to the ministers of our generous ally the king of france to undertake nothing in the negotiations for peace or truce without their knowledge and concurrence and ultimately to govern yourselves by their advice and opinion if france had been actuated only by unselfish motives in supporting the colonies in their revolt against great britain these instructions might have been acceptable and even advisable but such was not the case france was working not so much with philanthropic purposes or for sentimental reasons as for the restoration to her former position of supremacy in europe revenge upon england was only a part of a larger plan of national aggrandizement the treaty with france in seventeen seventy eight had declared that war should be continued until the independence of the united states had been established and it appeared as if that were the main purpose of the alliance for her own good reasons france had dragged spain into the struggle spain of course fought to cripple great britain and not to help the united states in return for this support france was pledged to assist spain in obtaining certain additions to her territory in so far as these additions related to north america the interests of spain and those of the united states were far from being identical in fact they were frequently in direct opposition spain was already in possession of louisiana and by prompt action on her entry into the war in seventeen eighty she had succeeded in getting control of eastern louisiana and of practically all the floridas except st augustine to consolidate these holdings and round out her american empire spain would have liked to obtain the title to all the land between the allegheny mountains and the mississippi failing this however she seemed to prefer that the region northwest of the ohio river should belong to the british rather than to the united states under these circumstances it was fortunate for the united states that the american peace commissioners were broad-minded enough to appreciate the situation and to act on their own responsibility benjamin franklin although he was not the first to be appointed was generally considered to be the chief of the commission by reason of his age experience and reputation over seventy-five years old he was more universally known and admired than probably any man of his time this many-sided american printer almanac maker writer scientist and philosopher by the variety of his abilities as well as by the charm of his manner seemed to have found his real mission in the diplomatic field where he could serve his country and at the same time with credit to himself preach his own doctrines when franklin was sent to europe at the outbreak of the revolution it was as if destiny had intended him for that particular task his achievements had already attracted attention in his fur cap and eccentric dress he fulfilled admirably the parisian ideal of the forest philosopher and with his facility in conversation as well as by the attractiveness of his personality he won both young and old but with his undoubted zeal for liberty and his unquestioned love of country franklin never departed from the quaker principles he affected and always tried to avoid a fight in these efforts owing to his shrewdness and his willingness to compromise he was generally successful 
john adams being then the american representative at the hague was the first commissioner to be appointed indeed when he was first named in seventeen seventy nine he was to be sole commissioner to negotiate peace and it was the influential french minister to the united states who was responsible for others being added to the commission adams was a sturdy new englander of british stock and of a distinctly english type medium height a stout figure and a ruddy face no one questioned his honesty his straightforwardness or his lack of tact being a man of strong mind of wide reading and even great learning and having serene confidence in the purity of his motives as well as in the soundness of his judgment adams was little inclined to surrender his own views and was ready to carry out his ideas against every obstacle by nature as well as by training he seems to have been incapable of understanding the french he was suspicious of them and he disapproved of franklin's popularity even as he did of his personality five commissioners in all were named but thomas jefferson and henry lawrence did not take part in the negotiations so that the only other active member was john jay then thirty-seven years old and already a man of prominence in his own country a french huguenot stock and type he was tall and slender with somewhat of a scholar's stoop and was usually dressed in black his manners were gentle and unassuming but his face with its penetrating black eyes its aquiline nose and pointed chin revealed a proud and sensitive disposition he had been sent to the court of spain in seventeen eighty and there he had learned enough to arouse his suspicions if nothing more of spain's designs as well as of the french intention to support them in the spring of seventeen eighty two adams felt obliged to remain at the hague in order to complete the negotiations already successfully begun for a commercial treaty with the netherlands franklin thus the only commissioner on the ground in paris began informal negotiations alone but sent an urgent call to jay in spain who was convinced of the fruitlessness of his mission there and promptly responded jay's experience in spain and his knowledge of spanish hopes had led him to believe that the french were not especially concerned about american interests but were in fact willing to sacrifice them if necessary to placate spain he accordingly insisted that the american commissioners should disregard their instructions and without the knowledge of france should deal directly with great britain in this contention he was supported by adams when he arrived but it was hard to persuade franklin to accept this point of view for he was unwilling to believe anything so unworthy of his admiring and admired french nevertheless with his cautious shrewdness he finally yielded so far as to agree to see what might come out of direct negotiations the rest was relatively easy of course there were difficulties and such sharp differences of opinion that even after long negotiations some matters had to be compromised some problems too were found insoluble and were finally left without a settlement but such difficulties as did exist were slight in comparison with the previous hopelessness of reconciling american and spanish ambitions especially when the latter were supported by france on the one hand the americans were the protege of the french and were expected to give way before the claims of their patrons friends to an extent which threatened to limit seriously their growth and development on the other hand they were the younger sons of england uncivilized by their wilderness life ungrateful and rebellious but still to be treated by england as children of the blood in the all-important question of extent of territory where spain and france would have limited the united states to the east of the allegheny mountains great britain was persuaded without great difficulty having once conceded independence to the united states to yield the boundaries which she herself had formerly claimed from the atlantic ocean on the east to the mississippi river on the west and from canada on the north to the southern boundary of georgia unfortunately the northern line through ignorance and carelessness rather than through malice was left uncertain at various points and became the subject of almost continuous controversy until the last bit of it was settled in nineteen eleven the fisheries of the north atlantic for which newfoundland served as the chief entrepot had been one of the great assets of north america from the time of its discovery they had been one of the chief prizes at stake in the struggle between the french and the british for the possession of the continent and they had been of so much value that a british statue of seventeen seventy five which cut off the new england fisheries was regarded even after the intolerable acts of the previous year as the height of punishment for new england many englishmen would have been glad to see the americans excluded from these fisheries but john adams when he arrived from the hague displayed an appreciation of new england interests and the quality of his temper as well by flatly refusing to agree to any treaty which did not allow full fishing privileges the british accordingly yielded and the americans were granted fishing rights as heretofore enjoyed the right of navigation of the mississippi river it was declared in the treaty should forever remain free and open to both parties but here great britain was simply passing on to the united states a former right which she had received from france and was retaining for herself a similar right 
which might some time prove of use for as long as spain held both banks at the mouth of the mississippi river the right was of little practical value two subjects involving the greatest difficulty of arrangement were the compensation of the loyalists and the settlement of commercial indebtedness the latter was really a question of the payment of british creditors by american debtors for there was little on the other side of the balance sheet and it seems as if the frugal franklin would have preferred to make no concessions and would have allowed creditors to take their own chances of getting paid but the matter appeared to adams in a different light perhaps his new england conscience was aroused and in this point of view he was supported by jay it was therefore finally agreed that creditors on either side shall meet with no lawful impediment to the recovery of the full value in sterling money of all bona fide debts heretofore contracted however just this provision may have been its incorporation in the terms of the treaty was a mistake on the part of the commissioners because the government of the united states had no power to give effect to such an arrangement so that the provision had no more value than an emphatic expression of opinion accordingly when some of the states later disregarded this part of the treaty the british had an excuse for refusing to carry out certain of their own obligations the historian of the virginia federal convention of seventeen eighty eight h b grigsby relates an amusing incident growing out of the controversy over the payment of debts to creditors in england a scotchman john warden a prominent lawyer and good classical scholar but suspected rightly of tory leanings during the revolution learning of the large minority against the repeal of laws in conflict with the treaty of seventeen eighty three that is especially the laws as to the collection of debts by foreigners caustically remarked that some of the members of the house had voted against paying for the coats on their backs the story goes that he was summoned before the house in full session and was compelled to beg their pardon on his knees but as he rose pretending to brush the dust from his knees he pointed to the house and said audibly with evident double meaning upon my word a damned dirty house it is indeed the journal of the house however shows that the honour of the delegates was satisfied by a written assurance from mr warden that he meant in no way to affront the dignity of the house or to insult any of its members the other question that of compensating the loyalists for the loss of their property was not so simple a matter for the whole story of the revolution was involved there is a tendency among many scholars of the present day to regard the policy of the british toward their north american colonies as possibly unwise and blundering but as being entirely in accordance with the legal and constitutional rights of the mother country and to believe that the americans while they may have been practically and therefore morally justified in asserting their independence were still technically and legally in the wrong it is immaterial whether or not that point of view is accepted for its mere recognition is sufficient to explain the existence of a large number of americans who were steadfast in their support of the british side of the controversy indeed it has been estimated that as large a proportion as one-third of the population remained loyal to the crown numbers must remain more or less uncertain but probably the majority of the people in the united states whatever their feelings may have been tried to remain neutral or at least to appear so and it is undoubtedly true that the revolution was accomplished by an aggressive minority and that perhaps as great a number were actively loyal to great britain these loyalists comprised at least two groups one of these was a wealthy property-owning class representing the best social element in the colonies extremely conservative believing in privilege and fearing the rise of democracy the other was composed of the royal office holders which included some of the better families but was more largely made up of the lower class of political and social hangers-on who had been rewarded with these positions for political debts incurred in england the opposition of both groups to the revolution was inevitable and easily to be understood but it was also natural that the revolutionists should incline to hold the loyalists without distinction largely responsible for british pre-revolutionary policy asserting that they misinformed the government as to conditions and sentiment in america partly through stupidity and partly through selfish interest it was therefore perfectly comprehensible that the feeling should be bitter against them in the united states especially as they had given efficient aid to the british during the war in various states they were subjected to personal violence at the hands of indignant patriots many being forced to flee from their homes while their property was destroyed or confiscated and frequently these acts were legalized by statute the historian of the loyalists of massachusetts james h stark must not be expected to understate the case but when he is describing especially in new england the reign of terror which was established to suppress these people he writes loyalists were tarred and feathered and carried on rails gagged and bound for days at a time stoned fastened in a room with a fire and the chimney stopped on top advertised as public enemies so that they would be cut off 
from all dealings with their neighbours they had bullets shot into their bedrooms their horses poisoned or mutilated money or valuable plate extorted from them to save them from violence and on pretence of taking security for their good behaviour their houses and ships burned they were compelled to pay the guards who watched them in their houses and when carted about for the mob to stare at and abuse they were compelled to pay something at every town there is little doubt also that the confiscation of property and the expulsion of the owners from the community were helped on by people who were debtors to the loyalists and in this way saw a chance of escaping from the payment of their rightful obligations the act for confiscating the estates of certain persons commonly called absentees may have been a measure of self-defence for the state but it was passed by the votes of those who undoubtedly profited by its provisions those who had stood loyally by the crown must in turn be looked out for by the british government especially when the claims of justice were reinforced by the important consideration that many of those with property and financial interests in america were relatives of influential persons in england the immediate necessity during the war had been partially met by assisting thousands to go to canada where their descendants to-day form an important element in the population and are proud of being united empire loyalists while pensions and gifts were supplied to others now that the war was over the british were determined that americans should make good to the loyalists for all that they had suffered and his majesty's commissioners were hopeful at least of obtaining a proviso similar to the one relating to the collection of debts john adams however expressed the prevailing american idea when he said that paying debts and compensating tories were two very different things and jay asserted that there were certain of these refugees whom americans never would forgive but this was the one thing needed to complete the negotiations for peace and the british arguments on the injustice and irregularity of the treatment accorded to the loyalists were so strong that the american commissioners were finally driven to the excuse that the government of the confederation had no power over the individual states by whom the necessary action must be taken finally in a spirit of mutual concession at the end of the negotiations the americans agreed that congress should recommend to the legislatures of the respective states to provide for the restitution of properties which had been confiscated belonging to real british subjects and that persons of any other description might return to the united states for a period of twelve months and be unmolested in their endeavours to obtain the restitution with this show of yielding on the part of the american commissioners it was possible to conclude the terms of peace and the preliminary treaty was drawn accordingly and agreed to on november thirty seventeen eighty two franklin had been of such great service during all the negotiations smoothing down ruffled feelings by his suavity and tact and presenting difficult subjects in a way that made action possible that to him was accorded the unpleasant task of communicating what had been accomplished to vergennes the french minister and of requesting at the same time a fresh loan of twenty million francs franklin of course presented his case with much delicacy and kindliness of manner and with a fair degree of success vergennes thought that the signing of the articles was premature but he made no inconvenient remonstrances and procured six millions of the twenty on september three seventeen eighty three the definite treaty of peace was signed in due time it was ratified by the british parliament as well as by the american congress the new state duly accredited thus took his place in the family of nations but it was a very humble place that was first assigned to the united states of america End of chapter one chapter two of the fathers of the constitution by max ferrand this librivox recording is in the public domain trade and industry though the word revolution implies a violent break with the past there was nothing in the revolution that transformed the essential character or the characteristics of the american people the revolution severed the ties which bound the colonies to great britain it created some new activities some soldiers were diverted from their former trades and occupation but as the proportion of the population engaged in the war was relatively small and the area of country affected for any length of time was comparatively slight it is safe to say that in general the mass of the people remained about the same after the war as before the professional man was found in his same calling the artisan returned to his tools if he had ever laid them down the shopkeeper resumed his business if it had been interrupted the merchant went back to his trading and the farmer before the revolution remained a farmer afterward the country as a whole was in relatively good condition and the people were reasonably prosperous 
at least there was no general distress or poverty suffering had existed in the regions ravaged by war but no section had suffered unduly or had had to bear the burden of war during the entire period of fighting american products had been in demand especially in the west india islands and an illicit trade with the enemy had sprung up so that even during the war shippers were able to dispose of their commodities at good prices the americans are commonly said to have been an agricultural people but it would be more correct to say that the great majority of the people were dependent upon extractive industries which would include lumbering fishing and even the fur trade as well as the ordinary agricultural pursuits save for a few industries of which shipbuilding was one of the most important there was relatively little manufacturing apart from the household crafts these household industries had increased during the war but as it was with the individual so it was with the whole country the general course of industrial activity was much the same as it had been before the war a fundamental fact is to be observed in the economy of the young nation the people were raising far more tobacco and grain and were extracting far more of other products than they could possibly use themselves for the surplus they must find markets they had as well to rely upon the outside world for a great part of their manufactured goods especially for those of the higher grade in other words from the economic point of view the united states remained in the former colonial stage of industrial dependence which was aggravated rather than alleviated by the separation from great britain during the colonial period americans had carried on a large amount of this external trade by means of their own vessels the british navigation acts required the transportation of goods in british vessels manned by crews of british sailors and specified certain commodities which could be shipped to great britain only they also required that much of the european trade should pass by way of england but colonial vessels and colonial sailors came under the designation of british and no small part of the prosperity of new england and of the middle colonies as well have been due to the carrying trade it would seem therefore as if a primary need of the american people immediately after the revolution was to get access to their old markets and to carry the goods as much as possible in their own vessels in some directions they were successful one of the products in greatest demand was fish the fishing industry had been almost annihilated by the war but with the establishment of peace the new england fisheries began to recover they were in competition with the fishermen of france and england who were aided by large bounties yet the superior geographical advantages which the american fishermen possessed enabled them to maintain and expand their business and the rehabilitation of the fishing fleet was an important feature of their program in other directions they were not so successful the british still believed in their colonial system and applied its principles without regard to the interests of the united states such american products as they wanted they allowed to be carried to british markets but in british vessels certain commodities the production of which they wished to encourage within their own dominions they added to the prohibited list americans cried out indignantly that this was an attempt on the part of the british to punish their former colonies for their temerity in revolting the british government may well have derived some satisfaction from the fact that certain restrictions bore heavily upon new england as john adams complained but it would seem to be much nearer the truth to say that in a truly characteristic way the british were phlegmatically attending to their own interests and calmly ignoring the united states and that there was little malice in their policy european nations had regarded american trade as a profitable field of enterprise and as probably responsible for much of great britain's prosperity it was therefore a relatively easy matter for the united states to enter into commercial treaties with foreign countries these treaties however were not fruitful of any great result for with unimportant exceptions they left still in force the high import duties and prohibitions that marked the european tariffs of the time as well as many features of the old colonial system they were designed to legalize commerce rather than to encourage it still for a year or more after the war the demand for american products was great enough to satisfy almost everybody but in seventeen eighty four france and spain closed their colonial ports and thus excluded the shipping of the united states this proved to be so disastrous for their colonies that the french government soon was forced to relax its restrictions the british also 
made some concessions and where their orders were not modified they were evaded and so in the course of a few years the west india trade recovered more astonishing to the men of that time than it is to us was the fact that american foreign trade fell under british commercial control again whether it was that british merchants were accustomed to american ways of doing things and new american business conditions whether other countries found the commerce not as profitable as they had expected as certainly was the case with france whether american merchants and sea captains found themselves under disadvantages due to the absence of treaty protection which they had enjoyed as english subjects or whether it was the necessity of trading on british capital whatever the cause may have been within a comparatively few years a large part of american trade was in british hands as it had been before the revolution american trade with europe was carried on through english merchants very much as the navigation acts had prescribed from the very first settlement of the american continent the colonists had exhibited one of the earliest and most lasting characteristics of the american people adaptability the americans now proceeded to manifest that trade anew not only by adjusting themselves to renewed commercial dependence upon great britain but by seeking new avenues of trade a striking illustration of this is to be found in the development of trade with the far east captain cook's voyage around the world seventeen sixty eight to seventeen seventy one an account of which was first published in london in seventeen seventy three attracted a great deal of attention in america an edition of the new voyage was issued in new york in seventeen seventy four no sooner was the revolution over than there began that romantic trade with china and the northwest coast of america which made the fortunes of some families of salem and boston and philadelphia this commerce added to the prosperity of the country but above all it stimulated the imagination of americans in the same way another outlook was found in trade with russia by way of the baltic the foreign trade of the united states after the revolution thus passed through certain well-marked phases first there was a short period of prosperity owing to an unusual demand for american products this was followed by a longer period of depression and then came a gradual recovery through acceptance of the new conditions and adjustment to them a similar cycle may be traced in the domestic or internal trade in early days intercolonial commerce had been carried on mostly by water and when war interfered commerce almost ceased for want of roads the loss of ocean highways however stimulated road building and led to what might be regarded as the first good roads movement of the new nation except that to our eyes it would be a misuse of the word to call any of those roads good but anything which would improve the means of transportation took on a patriotic tinge and the building of roads and the cutting of canals were agitated until turnpike and canal companies became a favorite form of investment and in a few years the interstate land trade had grown to considerable importance but in the meantime water transportation was the main reliance and with the end of the war the coastwise trade had been promptly resumed for a time it prospered but the states affected by the general economic conditions and by jealousy tried to interfere with and divert the trade of others to their own advantage this was done by imposing fees and charges and duties not merely upon goods and vessels from abroad but upon those of their fellow-states james madison described the situation in the words so often quoted some of the states having no convenient ports for foreign commerce were subject to be taxed by their neighbors through whose ports their commerce was carried on new jersey placed between philadelphia and new york was likened to a cask tapped at both ends and north carolina between virginia and south carolina to a patient bleeding at both arms the business depression which very naturally followed the short revival of trade was so serious in its financial consequences that it has even been referred to as the panic of seventeen eighty five the united states afforded a good market for imported articles in seventeen eighty eight and seventeen eighty four all the better because of the supply of gold and silver which had been sent into the country by england and france to maintain their armies and fleets and which had remained in the united states but this influx of imported goods was one of the chief factors in causing the depression of seventeen eighty five as it brought ruin to many of those domestic industries which had sprung up in the days of non-intercourse or which had been stimulated by the artificial protection of the war to make matters worse the currency was in a confused condition 
in seventeen eighty four the entire coin of the land except coppers was the product of foreign mints english guineas crowns shillings and pence were still paid over the counters of shops and taverns and with them were mingled many french and spanish and some german coins the value of the gold pieces expressed in dollars was pretty much the same the country over but the dollar and the silver pieces regarded as fractions of a dollar had no less than five different values the importation of foreign goods was fast draining the hard money out of the country in an effort to relieve the situation but with the result of making it much worse several of the states began to issue paper money and this was in addition to the enormous quantities of paper which had been printed during the revolution and which was now worth but a small fraction of its face value the expanding currency and consequent depreciation in the value of money had immediately resulted in a corresponding rise of prices which for a while the states attempted to control but in seventeen seventy eight congress threw up its hands in despair and voted that all limitations of prices of gold and silver be taken off although the states for some time longer continued to endeavor to regulate prices by legislation the fluctuating value of the currency increased the opportunities for speculation which war conditions invariably offer and immense fortunes were suddenly accumulated a new financial group rose into prominence composed largely of those who were not accustomed to the use of money and who were consequently inclined to spend it recklessly and extravagantly many contemporaries comment upon these things of whom bisseau de varville may be taken as an example although he did not visit the united states until seventeen eighty eight the inhabitants prefer the splendor of wealth and the show of enjoyment to the simplicity of manners and the pure pleasures which result from it if there is a town on the american continent where the english luxury displays its follies it is new york you will find here the english fashions in the dress of the women you will see the most brilliant silks gauzes hats and borrowed hair equipages are rare but they are elegant the men have more simplicity in their dress they disdain jujaws but they take their revenge in the luxury of the table luxury forms already a class of men very dangerous to society i mean bachelors the expense of women causes matrimony to be dreaded by men tea forms as in england the basis of parties of pleasure many things are dearer here than in france a hairdresser asks twenty shilling a month washing costs four shillings a dozen an american writer of a later date looking back upon his earlier years was impressed by this same extravagance and his testimony may well be used to strengthen the impression which it is the purpose of the present narrative to convey the french and british armies circulated immense sums of money in gold and silver coin which had the effect of driving out of circulation the wretched paper currency which had till then prevailed immense quantities of british and french goods were soon imported our people imbibed a taste for foreign fashions and luxury and in the course of two or three years from the close of the war such an entire change had taken place in the habits and manners of our inhabitants that it almost appeared as if we had suddenly become a different nation the state and sober habits of our ancestors with their plain home manufactured clothing were suddenly laid aside and european goods of fine quality adopted in their stead fine ruffles powdered heads silks and scarlets decorated the men while the most costly silks satins chintzes calicoes muslins etc etc decorated our females nor was their diet less expensive for superb plate foreign spirits wines etc etc sparkled on the sideboards of many farmers the natural result of this change of the habits and customs of the people this aping of european manners and morals was to suddenly drain our country of its circulating specie and as a necessary consequence the people ran in debt times became difficult and money hard to raise the situation was serious and yet it was not as dangerous or even as critical as it has generally been represented because the fundamental bases of american prosperity were untouched the way by which americans could meet the emergency and recover from the hard times was fairly evident first to economize and then to find new outlets for their industrial energies but the process of adjustment was slow and painful there were not a few persons in the united states who were even disposed to regret that americans were not safely under british protection and prospering with great britain instead of suffering in political isolation end of chapter two chapter three of the fathers of the constitution by max ferrand this librivox recording is in the public domain
the confederation when peace came in seventeen eighty three there were in the united states approximately three million people who were spread over the whole atlantic coast from maine to georgia and back into the interior as far as the allegheny mountains and a relatively small number of settlers had crossed the mountain barrier about twenty per cent of the population or some six hundred thousand were negro slaves there was also a large alien element of foreign birth or descent poor when they arrived in america and although they had been able to raise themselves to a position of comparative comfort life among them was still crude and rough many of the people were poorly educated and lacking in cultivation and refinement and in a knowledge of the usages of good society not only were they looked down upon by other nations of the world there was within the united states itself a relatively small upper class inclined to regard the mass of the people as of an inferior order thus while forces were at work favorable to democracy the gentry remained in control of affairs after the revolution although their numbers were reduced by the emigration of the loyalists and their power was lessened the explanation of this aristocratic control may be found in the fact that the generation of the revolution had been accustomed to monarchy and to an upper class and that the people were wont to take their ideas and to accept suggestions from their betters without question or murmur this deferential attitude is attested by the indifference of citizens to the right of voting in our own day before the great extension of woman suffrage the number of persons voting approximated twenty per cent of the population but after the revolution less than five per cent of the white population voted there were many limitations upon the exercise of the suffrage but the small number of voters was only partially due to these restrictions for in later years without any radical change in suffrage qualifications the proportion of citizens who voted steadily increased the fact is that many of the people did not care to vote why should they when they were only registering the will or the wishes of their superiors but among the relatively small number who constituted the governing class there was a high standard of intelligence popular magazines were unheard of and newspapers were infrequent so that men depended largely upon correspondence and personal intercourse for the interchange of ideas there was time however for careful reading of the few available books there was time for thought for writing for discussion and for social intercourse it hardly seems too much to say therefore that there was seldom if ever a people certainly never a people scattered over so wide a territory who knew so much about government as did this controlling element of the people of the united states the practical character as well as the political genius of the americans was never shown to better advantage than at the outbreak of the revolution when the quarrel with the mother country was manifesting itself in the conflict between the governors and other appointed agents of the crown and the popularly elected houses of the colonial legislatures when the crown resorted to dissolving the legislatures the revolting colonists kept up and observed the forms of government when the legislature was prevented from meeting the members would come together and call themselves a congress or a convention and instead of adopting laws or orders would issue what were really nothing more than recommendations but which they expected would be obeyed by their supporters to enforce these recommendations extra legal committees generally backed by public opinion and sometimes concretely supported by an organized mob would meet in towns and counties and would be often effectively centralized where the opponents of the british policy were in control in several of the colonies the want of orderly government became so serious that in seventeen seventy five the continental congress advised them to form temporary governments until the trouble with great britain had been settled when independence was declared congress recommended to all the states that they should adopt governments of their own in accordance with that recommendation in the course of a very few years each state established an independent government and adopted a written constitution it was a time when men believed in the social contract or the compact theory of the state that states originated through agreement as the case might be between king and nobles between king and people or among the people themselves in support of this doctrine no less an authority than the bible was often quoted such a passage for example as second samuel verse three so all the elders of israel came to the king to hebron and king david made a covenant with them in hebron before the lord and they anointed david king over israel 
as a philosophical speculation to explain why people were governed or consented to be governed this theory went back at least to the greeks and doubtless much earlier and though of some significance in mediaeval thought it became of greater importance in british political philosophy especially through the works of thomas hobbes and john locke a very practical application of the compact theory was made in the english revolution of sixteen eighty eight when in order to avoid the embarrassment of deposing the king the convention of the parliament adopted the resolution that king james the second having endeavoured to subvert the constitution of the kingdom by breaking the original contract between king and people and having by the advice of jesuits and other wicked persons violated the fundamental laws and withdrawn himself out of this kingdom has abdicated the government and that the throne is hereby vacant these theories were developed by jean jacques rousseau in his contract social a book so attractively written that it eclipsed all other works upon the subject and resulted in his being regarded as the author of the doctrine and through him they spread all over europe conditions in america did more than lend colour to pale speculation they seemed to take this hypothesis out of the realm of theory and to give it practical application what happened when men went into the wilderness to live the pilgrim fathers on board the mayflower entered into an agreement which was signed by the heads of families who took part in the enterprise we whose names are underwritten do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of god and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic other colonies especially in new england with this example before them of a social contract entered into similar compacts or plantation covenants as they were called but the colonists were also accustomed to having written charters granted which continued for a time at least to mark the extent of governmental powers through this intermingling of theory and practice it was the most natural thing in the world when americans came to form their new state governments that they should provide written instruments framed by their own representatives which not only bound them to be governed in this way but also placed limitations upon the governing bodies as the first great series of written constitutions these frames of government attracted wide attention congress printed a set for general distribution and numerous editions were circulated both at home and abroad the constitutions were brief documents varying from one thousand to twelve thousand words in length which established the framework of the governmental machinery most of them before proceeding to practical working details enunciated a series of general principles upon the subject of government and political morality in what were called declarations or bills of rights the character of these declarations may be gathered from the following excerpts that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety that no man or set of men are entitled to exclusive or separate emoluments or privileges from the community but in consideration of public services the body politic is formed by a voluntary association of individuals it is a social compact by which the whole people covenants with each citizen and each citizen with the whole people that all shall be governed by certain laws for the common good that all power of suspending laws or the execution of laws by any authority without consent of the representatives of the people is injurious to their rights and ought not to be exercised that general warrants are grievous and oppressive and ought not to be granted all penalties ought to be proportioned to the nature of the offence that sanguinary laws ought to be avoided as far as is consistent with the safety of the state and no law to inflict cruel and unusual pains and penalties ought to be made in any case or at any time hereafter no magistrate or court of law shall demand excessive bail or sureties impose excessive fines every individual has a natural and unalienable right to worship god according to the dictates of his own conscience and reason that the freedom of the press is one of the great bulwarks of liberty and can never be restrained but by despotic governments it will be perceived at once that these are but variations of the english declaration of rights of sixteen eighty nine which indeed was consciously followed as a model and yet there is a world-wide difference between the english model and these american copies the earlier document enunciated the rights of english subjects the recent infringement of which made it desirable that they should be reasserted in convincing form the american documents asserted rights which the colonists generally had enjoyed and which they declared to be governing principles for all peoples in all future times but the greater significance of these state constitutions is to be found in their quality as working instruments of government there was indeed little difference between the old colonial and the new state governments 
the inhabitants of each of the thirteen states had been accustomed to a large measure of self-government and when they took matters into their own hands they were not disposed to make any radical changes in the forms to which they had become accustomed accordingly the state governments that were adopted simply continued a framework of government almost identical with that of colonial times to be sure the governor and other appointed officials were now elected either by the people or the legislature and so were ultimately responsible to the electors instead of to the crown and other changes were made which in the long run might prove of far-reaching and even of vital significance and yet the machinery of government seemed the same as that to which the people were already accustomed the average man was conscious of no difference at all in the working of the government under the new order in fact in connecticut and rhode island the most democratic of all the colonies where the people had been privileged to elect their own governors as well as legislatures no change whatever was necessary and the old charters were continued as state constitutions down to eighteen eighteen and eighteen forty two respectively to one who has been accustomed to believe that the separation from a monarchical government meant the establishment of democracy a reading of these first state constitutions is likely to cause a rude shock a shrewd english observer travelling a generation later in the united states went to the root of the whole matter in remarking of the americans that when their independence was achieved their mental condition was not instantly changed their deference for rank and for judicial and legislative authority continued nearly unimpaired they might declare that all men are created equal and bills of rights might assert that government rested upon the consent of the governed but these constitutions carefully provided that such consent should come from property owners and in many of the states from religious believers and even followers of the christian faith the man of small means might vote but none save well-to-do christians could legislate and in many states none but a rich christian could be a governor in south carolina for example a freehold of ten thousand pounds currency was required of the governor lieutenant governor and members of the council two thousand pounds of the members of the senate and while every elector was eligible to the house of representatives he had to acknowledge the being of a god and to believe in a future state of rewards and punishments as well as to hold a free hold at least of fifty acres of land or a town lot it was government by a property-owning class but in comparison with other countries this class represented a fairly large and increasing proportion of the population in america the opportunity of becoming a property owner was open to every one or at that phase would then have been understood to most white men this system of class control is illustrated by the fact that with the exception of massachusetts the new state constitutions were never submitted to the people for approval the democratic sympathizer of to-day is inclined to point to those first state governments as a continuance of the old order but to the conservative of that time it seemed as if radical and revolutionary changes were taking place the bills of rights declared that no men or set of men are entitled to exclusive or separate emoluments or privileges from the community but in consideration of public services property qualifications and other restrictions on office holding and the exercise of the suffrage were lessened four states declared in their constitutions against the entailment of estates and primogeniture was abolished in aristocratic virginia there was a fairly complete abolition of all vestiges of feudal tenure in the holding of land so that it may be said that in this period full ownership of property was established the further separation of church and state was also carried out certainly levelling influences were at work and the people as a whole had moved one step farther in the direction of equality and democracy and it was well that the revolution was not any more radical and revolutionary than it was the change was gradual and therefore more lasting one finds readily enough contemporary statements to the effect that although there are no nobles in america there is a class of men denominated gentlemen who by reason of their wealth their talents their education their families or the offices they hold aspire to a preeminence but the same observer adds this is something which the people refuse to grant them another contemporary contributes the observation that there was not so much respect paid to gentlemen of rank as there should be and that the lower orders of people behave as if they were on a footing of equality with them whether the state constitutions are to be regarded as property conserving aristocratic instruments or as progressive documents depends upon the point of view and so it is with the spirit of union or of nationality in the united states one student emphasizes the fact of there being thirteen independent republics differing widely in climate in soil in occupation in everything which makes up the social and economic life of the people while another sees the united states a nation there is something to be said for both sides and doubtless the truth lies between them for there were forces making for disintegration as well as for unification 
to the student of the present day however the latter seemed to have been the stronger and more important although the possibility was never absent that the thirteen states would go their separate ways there are few things so potent as a common danger to bring discordant elements into working harmony several times in the century and a half of their existence when the colonists found themselves threatened by their enemies they had united or at least made an effort to unite for mutual help the new england confederation of sixteen forty three was organized primarily for protection against the indians and incidentally against the dutch and french whenever trouble threatened with any of the european powers or with the indians and that was frequently a plan would be broached for getting the colonies to combine their efforts sometimes for the immediate necessity and sometimes for a broader purpose the best known of these plans was that presented to the albany congress of seventeen fifty four which had been called to make effective preparation for the inevitable struggle with the french and indians the beginning of the troubles which culminated in the final breach with great britain had quickly brought united action in the form of the stamp act congress of seventeen sixty five in the committees of correspondence and then in the continental congress it was not merely that the leaven of the revolution was already working to bring about the freer interchange of ideas instinct and experience led the colonies to united action the very day that the continental congress appointed a committee to frame a declaration of independence another committee was ordered to prepare articles of union a month later as soon as the declaration of independence had been adopted this second committee of which john dickinson of pennsylvania was chairman presented to congress a report in the form of articles of confederation although the outbreak of fighting made some sort of united action imperative this plan of union was subjected to debate intermittently for over sixteen months and even after being adopted by congress toward the end of seventeen seventy seven it was not ratified by the states until march seventeen eighty one when the war was already drawing to a close the exigencies of the hour forced congress without any authorization to act as if it had been duly empowered and in general to proceed as if the confederation had been formed benjamin franklin was an enthusiast for union it was he who had submitted the plan of union to the albany congress in seventeen fifty four which with modifications was recommended by that congress for adoption it provided for a grand council of representatives chosen by the legislature of each colony the members to be proportioned to the contribution of that colony to the american military service in matters concerning the colonies as a whole especially in indian affairs the grand council was to be given extensive powers of legislation and taxation the executive was to be a president or governor-general appointed and paid by the crown with the right of nominating all military officers and with a veto upon all acts of the grand council the project was far in advance of the times and ultimately failed of acceptance but in seventeen seventy five with the beginning of the troubles with great britain franklin took his albany plan and after modifying it in accordance with the experience of twenty years submitted it to the continental congress as a new plan of government under which the colonies might unite franklin's plan of seventeen seventy five seems to have attracted little attention in america and possibly it was not generally known but much was made of it abroad where it soon became public probably in the same way that other franklin papers came out it seems to have been his practice to make with his own hand several copies of such a document which he would send to his friends with the statement that as the document in question was confidential they might not otherwise see a copy of it of course the inevitable happened and such documents found their way into print to the apparent surprise and dismay of the author incidentally this practice caused confusion in later years because each possessor of such a document would claim that he had the original whatever may have been the procedure in this particular case it is fairly evident that dickinson's committee took franklin's plan of seventeen seventy five as the starting point of its work and after revision submitted it to congress as their report for some of the most important features of the articles of confederation are to be found sometimes word for word in franklin's draft this explanation of the origin of the articles of confederation is helpful and perhaps essential in understanding the form of government established because that government in its main features had been devised for an entirely different condition of affairs when a strong centralized government would not have been accepted even if it had been wanted it provided for a league of friendship with the primary purpose of considering preparation for action rather than of taking the initiative furthermore the final stages of drafting the articles of confederation had occurred at the outbreak of the war when the people of various states were showing a disposition to follow readily suggestions that came from those whom they could trust and when they seemed to be willing to submit without compulsion to orders from the same source these circumstances quite as much as the inexperience of congress and the jealousy of the states 
account for the inefficient form of government which was devised and inefficient the confederation certainly was the only organ of government was a congress in which every state was entitled to one vote and was represented by a delegation whose members were appointed annually as the legislature of the state might direct whose expenses were paid by the state and who were subject to recall in other words it was a council of states whose representatives had little incentive to independence of action extensive powers were granted to this congress of determining on peace and war of entering into treaties and alliances of maintaining an army and a navy of establishing post offices of coining money and of making requisitions upon the states for their respective share of expenses incurred for the common defence or general welfare but none of these powers could be exercised without the consent of nine states which was equivalent to requiring a two-thirds vote and even when such a vote had been obtained and a decision had been reached there was nothing to compel the individual states to obey beyond the mere declaration in the articles of confederation that every state shall abide by the determinations of the united states in congress assembled no executive was provided for except that congress was authorized to appoint such other committees and civil officers as may be necessary for managing the general affairs of the united states under their direction in judicial matters congress was to serve as the last resort on appeal in all disputes and differences between states and congress might establish courts for the trial of piracy and felonies committed on the high seas and for determining appeals in cases of prize capture the plan of a government was there but it lacked any driving force congress might declare war but the states might decline to participate in it congress might enter into treaties but it could not make the states live up to them congress might borrow money but it could not be sure of repaying it and congress might decide disputes without being able to make the parties accept the decision the pressure of necessity might keep the states together for a time yet there is no disguising the fact that the articles of confederation form nothing more than a gentleman's agreement End of chapter 3chapter four of the fathers of the constitution by max ferrand this librivox recording is in the public domain the northwest ordinance the population of the united states was like a body of water that was being steadily enlarged by internal springs and external tributaries it was augmented both from within and from without from natural increase and from immigration it had spread over the whole coast from maine to georgia and slowly back into the interior at first along the lines of river communication and then gradually filling up the spaces between until the larger part of the available land east of the allegheny mountains was settled there the stream was checked as if dammed by the mountain barrier but the population was trickling through wherever it could find an opening slowly wearing channels until finally when the obstacles were overcome it broke through with a rush twenty years before the revolution the expanding population had reached the mountains and was ready to go beyond the difficulty of crossing the mountains was not insuperable but the french and indian war followed by pontiac's conspiracy made outlying frontier settlement dangerous if not impossible the arbitrary restriction of western settlement by the proclamation of seventeen sixty three did not stop the more adventurous but did hold back the mass of the population until near the time of the revolution when a few bands of settlers moved into kentucky and tennessee and rendered important but inconspicuous service in the fighting but so long as the title to that territory was in doubt no considerable body of people would move into it and it was not until the treaty of peace in seventeen eighty three determined that the western country as far as the mississippi river was to belong to the united states that the dammed up population broke over the mountains in a veritable flood the western country and its people presented no easy problem to the united states how to hold those people when the pull was strong to draw them from the union how to govern citizens so widely separated from the older communities and of most immediate importance how to hold the land itself it was indeed the question of the ownership of the land beyond the mountains which delayed the ratification of the articles of confederation some of the states by right of their colonial charter grants from sea to sea were claiming large parts of the western region 
other states whose boundaries were fixed could put forward no such claims and as they were therefore limited in their area of expansion they were fearful lest in the future they should be overbalanced by those states which might obtain extensive property in the west it was maintained that the proclamation of seventeen sixty three had changed this western territory into crown lands and as by the treaty of peace the title had passed to the united states the non-claimant states had demanded in self-defence that the western land should belong to the country as a whole and not to the individual states rhode island maryland and delaware were most seriously affected and they were insistent upon this point rhode island and at length delaware gave in so that by february seventeen seventy nine maryland alone held out in may of that year the instructions of maryland to her delegates were read in congress positively forbidding them to ratify the plan of union unless they should receive definite assurances that the western country would become the common property of the united states as the consent of all of the thirteen states was necessary to the establishment of the confederation this refusal of maryland brought matters to a crisis the question was eagerly discussed and early in seventeen eighty the deadlock was broken by the action of new york in authorizing her representatives to cede her entire claim in western lands to the united states it matters little that the claim of new york was not as good as that of some of the other states especially that of virginia the whole situation was changed it was no longer necessary for maryland to defend her position but the claimant states were compelled to justify themselves before the country for not following new york's example congress wisely refrained from any assertion of jurisdiction and only urgently recommended that states having claims to western lands should cede them in order that the one obstacle to the final ratification of the articles of confederation might be removed without much question virginia's claim was the strongest but the pressure was too great even for her and she finally yielded ceding to the united states upon certain conditions all her lands northwest of the ohio river then the maryland delegates were empowered to ratify the articles of confederation this was early in seventeen eighty one and in a very short time the other states had followed the example of new york and virginia certain of the conditions imposed by virginia were not acceptable to congress and three years later upon specific request that state withdrew the objectionable conditions and made the cession absolute the territory thus ceded north and west of the ohio river constituted the public domain its boundaries were somewhat indefinite but subsequent surveys confirmed the rough estimate that it contained from one to two hundred millions of acres it was supposed to be worth on the average about a dollar an acre which would make this property an asset sufficient to meet the debts of the war and to leave a balance for the running expenses of the government it thereby became one of the strong bonds holding the union together land was the first cry of the storm-tossed mariners of columbus for three centuries the leading fact of american history has been that soon after sixteen hundred a body of europeans mostly englishmen settled on the edge of the greatest piece of unoccupied agricultural land in the temperate zone and proceeded to subdue it to the uses of man for three centuries the chief task of american mankind has been to go up westward against the land and to possess it our wars our independence our state building our political democracy our plasticity with respect to immigration our mobility of thought our ardor of initiative our mildness and our prosperity all are but incidents or products of this prime historical fact it is seldom that one's attention is so caught and held as by the happy suggestion that american interest in land or rather interest in american land began with the discovery of the continent even a momentary consideration of the subject however is sufficient to indicate how important was the desire for land as a motive of colonization the foundation of european governmental and social organizations had been laid in feudalism a system of land-holding and service and although european states might have lost their original feudal character and although new classes had arisen land-holding still remained the basis of social distinction one can readily imagine that america would be considered as el dorado where one of the rarest commodities as well as one of the most precious possessions was found in almost unlimited quantities and could be had for the asking 
it is no wonder that family estates were sought in america and that to the lower classes it seemed as if a heaven were opening on earth even though available land appeared to be almost unlimited in quantity and easy to acquire it was a possession that was generally increasing in value of course wasteful methods of farming wore out some lands especially in the south but taking it by and large throughout the country with time and increasing density of population the value of the land was increasing the acquisition of land was a matter of investment or at least of speculation in fact the purchase of land was one of the favorite get-rich-quick schemes of the time george washington was not the only man who invested largely in western lands a list of those who did would read like a political or social directory of the time patrick henry james wilson robert morris governor morris chancellor kent henry knox and james monroe were among them it is therefore easy to understand why so much importance attached to the claims of the several states and to the cession of that western land by them to the united states but something more was necessary if the land was to attain anything like its real value settlers must be induced to occupy it of course it was possible to let the people go out as they pleased and take up land and to let the government collect from them as might be possible at a fixed rate but experience during colonial days had shown the weakness of such a method and congress was apparently determined to keep under its own control the region which it now possessed to provide for orderly sale and to permit settlement only so far as it might not endanger the national interests the method of land sales and the question of government for the western country were recognized as different aspects of the same problem the virginia offer of cession forced the necessity of a decision and no sooner was the virginia offer framed in an acceptable form in seventeen eighty three than two committees were appointed by congress to report upon these two questions of land sales and of government thomas jefferson was made chairman of both these committees he was then forty years old and one of the most remarkable men in the country born on the frontier his father from the upper middle class his mother a randolph he had been trained to an outdoor life but he was also a prodigy in his studies and entered william and mary college with advanced standing at the age of eighteen many stories are told of his precocity and ability all of which tend to forecast the later man of catholic tastes omnivorous interest and extensive but superficial knowledge he was a strange combination of natural aristocrat and theoretical democrat a philosopher and practical politician after having been a student in the law office of george wythe and being a friend of patrick henry jefferson early espoused the cause of the revolution and it was his hand that drafted the declaration of independence he then resigned from congress to assist in the organization of government in his own state for two years and a half he served in the virginia assembly and brought about the repeal of the law of entailment the abolition of primogeniture the recognition of freedom of conscience and the encouragement of education he was governor of virginia for two years and then having declined re-election returned to congress in seventeen eighty three there among his other accomplishments as chairman of the committee he reported the treaty of peace and as chairman of another committee devised and persuaded congress to adopt a national system of coinage which in its essentials is still in use it is easy to criticize jefferson and to pick flaws in the things that he said as well as in the things that he did but practically every one admits that he was closely in touch with the course of events and understood the temper of his contemporaries in this period of transition from the old order to the new he seems to have expressed the genius of american institutions better than almost any other man of his generation he possessed a quality that enabled him in the declaration of independence to give voice to the hopes and aspirations of a rising nationality and that enabled him in his own state to bring about so many reforms just how much actual influence thomas jefferson had in the framing of the american land policy is not clear although the draft of the committee report in seventeen eighty four is in jefferson's handwriting it is altogether probable that more credit is to be given to thomas hutchins the geographer of the united states and to william grayson of virginia especially for the final form which the measure took for jefferson retired from the chairmanship and had already gone to europe when the land ordinance was adopted by congress in seventeen eighty five this ordinance has been superseded by later enactments to which references are usually made but the original ordinance is one of the great pieces of american legislation for it contained the fundamentals of the american land system which with the modifications experience has introduced 
has proved to be permanently workable and which has been envied and in several instances copied by other countries like almost all successful institutions of that sort the land ordinance of seventeen eighty five was not an immediate creation but was a development out of former practices and customs and was in the nature of a compromise its essential features were the method of survey and the process for the sale of land new england with its town system had in the course of its expansion been accustomed to proceed in an orderly method but on a relatively small scale the south on the other hand had granted lands on a larger scale and had permitted individual selection in a haphazard manner the plan which congress adopted was that of the new england survey with the southern method of extensive holdings the system is repellent in its rectangular orderliness but it made the process of recording titles easy and complete and it was capable of indefinite expansion these were matters of cardinal importance for in the course of one hundred and forty years the united states was to have under its control nearly two thousand million acres of land the primary feature of the land policy was the orderly survey in advance of sale in the next place the township was taken as the unit and its size was fixed at six miles square provision was then made for the sale of townships alternately entire and by sections of one mile square or six hundred and forty acres each in every township a section was reserved for educational purposes that is the land was to be disposed of and the proceeds used for the development of public schools in that region and finally the united states reserved four sections in the centre of each township to be disposed of at a later time it was expected that a great increase in the value of the land would result and it was proposed that the government should reap a part of the profits it is evident that the primary purpose of the public land policy as first developed was to acquire revenue for the government but it was also evident that there was a distinct purpose of encouraging settlement the two were not incompatible but the greater interest of the government was in obtaining a return for the property the other committee of which jefferson was chairman made its report of a plan for the government of the western territory upon the very day that the virginia session was finally accepted march the first seventeen eighty four and with some important modifications jefferson's ordinance or the ordinance of seventeen eighty four as it was commonly called was ultimately adopted in this case jefferson rendered a service similar to that of framing the declaration of independence his plan was somewhat theoretical and visionary but largely practical and it was constructive work of a high order displaying not so much originality as sympathetic appreciation of what had already been done and an instinctive forecast of future development jefferson seemed to be able to gather up ideas some conscious and some latent in men's minds and to express them in a form that was generally acceptable it is interesting to find in the articles of confederation article eleven that canada acceding to this confederation and joining in the measures of the united states shall be admitted into and entitled to all the advantages of this union but no other colony shall be admitted into the same unless such admission be agreed to by nine states the real importance of this article lay in the suggestion of an enlargement of the confederation the confederation was never intended to be a union of only thirteen states before the session of their western claims it seemed to be inevitable that some of the states should be broken up into several units at the very time that the formation of the confederation was under discussion vermont issued a declaration of independence from new york and new hampshire with the expectation of being admitted into the union it was impolitic to recognize the appeal at that time but it seems to have been generally understood that sooner or later vermont would come in as a full-fledged state it might have been a revolutionary suggestion by maryland when the cession of western lands was under discussion that congress should have sole power to fix the western boundaries of the states but her further proposal was not even regarded as radical that congress should lay out the land beyond the boundaries so ascertained into separate and independent states it seems to have been taken as a matter of course in the procedure of congress and was accepted by the states but if the idea was one thing its carrying out was quite another here was a great extent of western territory which would be valuable only as it could be sold to prospective settlers one of the first things these settlers would demand was protection protection against the indians possibly also against the british and the spanish and protection in their ordinary civil life 
the former was a detail of military organization and was in due time provided by the establishment of military forts and garrisons the latter was the problem which jefferson's committee was attempting to solve the ordinance of seventeen eighty four disregarded the natural physical features of the western country and by degrees of latitude and meridians of longitude arbitrarily divided the public domain into rectangular districts to the first of which the following names were applied sylvania michigania Cheronesis, asinicipia metropotamia illinois saratoga washington palapotamia polypsipia the amusement which this absurd and thoroughly jeffersonian nomenclature is bound to cause ought not to detract from the really important features of the ordinance in each of the districts into which the country was divided the settlers might be authorized by congress for the purpose of establishing a temporary government to adopt the constitution and laws of any one of the original states when any such area should have twenty thousand free inhabitants it might receive authority from congress to establish a permanent constitution and government and should be entitled to a representative in congress with the right of debating but not of voting and finally when the inhabitants of any one of these districts should equal in number those of the least populous of the thirteen original states their delegates should be admitted into congress on an equal footing jefferson's ordinance though adopted was never put into operation various explanations have been offered for this failure to give it a fair trial it has been said that jefferson himself was to blame in the original draft of his ordinance jefferson had provided for the abolition of slavery in the new states after the year eighteen hundred and when congress refused to accept this clause jefferson in a manner quite characteristic seemed to lose all interest in the plan there were however other objections for there were those who felt that it was somewhat indefinite to promise admission into the confederation of certain sections of the country as soon as their population should equal in number that of the least populous of the original states if the original states should increase in population to any extent the new states might never be admitted but on the other hand if from any cause the population of one of the smaller states should suddenly decrease might not the resulting influx of new states prove dangerous but the real reason why the ordinance remained a dead letter was that while it fixed the limits within which local governments might act it left the creation of those governments wholly to the future at vincennes for example the ordinance made no change in the political habits of the people the local government bowled along merrily under this system there was the greatest abundance of government for the more the united states neglected them the more authority their officials assumed nor could the ordinance operate until settlers became numerous it was partly indeed to hasten settlement that the ordinance of seventeen eighty five for the survey and sale of the public lands was passed in the meantime efforts were being made by congress to improve the unsatisfactory ordinance for the government of the west committees were appointed reports were made and at intervals of weeks or months the subject was considered some amendments were actually adopted but congress notoriously inefficient hesitated to undertake a fundamental revision of the ordinance then suddenly in july seventeen eighty seven after a brief period of adjournment congress took up the subject and within a week adopted the now famous ordinance of seventeen eighty seven the stimulus which aroused congress to activity seems to have come from the ohio company from the very beginning of the public domain there was a strong sentiment in favor of using western land for settlement by revolutionary soldiers some of these lands had been offered as bounties to encourage enlistment and after the war the project of soldiers settlement in the west was vigorously agitated the ohio company of associates was made up of veterans of the revolution who were looking for homes in the west and of other persons who were willing to support a worthy cause by a subscription which might turn out to be a good investment the company wished to buy land in the west and congress had land which it wished to sell under such circumstances it was easy to strike a bargain the land as we have seen was roughly estimated at one dollar an acre but as the company wished to purchase a million acres it demanded and obtained wholesale rates of two-thirds of the usual price it also obtained the privilege of paying at least a portion in certificates of revolutionary indebtedness some of which were worth about twelve and a half cents on the dollar only a little calculation is required to show that a large quantity of land was therefore sold at about eight or nine cents an acre it was in connection with this land sale that the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven was adopted the promoter of this enterprise undertaken by the ohio company was manasseh cutler of ipswich massachusetts a clergyman by profession who had served as a chaplain 
in the revolutionary war but his interests and activities extended far beyond the bounds of his profession when the people of his parish were without proper medical advice he applied himself to the study and practice of medicine at about the same time he took up the study of botany and because of his describing several hundred species of plants he is regarded as the pioneer botanist of new england his next interest seems to have grown out of his revolutionary associations for it centred in this project for settlement of the west and he was appointed the agent of the ohio company it was in this capacity that he had come to new york and made the bargain with congress which has just been described cutler must have been a good lobbyist for congress was not an efficient body and unremitting labor as well as diplomacy was required for so large and important a matter two things indicate his method of procedure in the first place he found it politic to drop his own candidate for the governorship of the new territory and to endorse general arthur st clair then president of congress and in the next place he accepted the suggestion of colonel william dewar for the formation of another company known as the scioto associates to purchase five million acres of land on similar terms but that it should be kept a profound secret it was not an accident that colonel dewar was secretary of the board of the treasury through whom these purchases were made nor that associated with him in this speculation were a number of the principal characters in the city these land deals were completed afterwards but there is little doubt that there was a direct connection between them and the adoption of the ordinance of government the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven was so successful in its working and its renown became so great that claims of authorship even for separate articles have been filed in the name of almost every person who had the slightest excuse for being considered thousands of pages have been written in eulogy and in dispute to the helpful clearing up of some points and to the obscuring of others but the authorship of this or of that clause is of much less importance than the scope of the document as a working plan of government as such the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven owes much to jefferson's ordinance of seventeen eighty four under the new ordinance a governor and three judges were to be appointed who along with their other functions were to select such laws as they thought best from the statute books of all the states the second stage in self-government would be reached when the population contained five thousand free men of age then the people were to have a representative legislature with the usual privilege of making their own laws provision was made for dividing the whole region northwest of the ohio river into three or four or five districts and the final stage of government was reached when any one of these districts had sixty thousand free inhabitants for it might then establish its own constitution and government and be admitted into the union on an equal footing with the original states the last named provision for admission into the union being in the nature of a promise for the future was not included in the body of the document providing for the government but was contained in certain articles of compact between the original states and the people and states in the said territory which should for ever remain unalterable unless by common consent these articles of compact were in general similar to the bills of rights in state constitutions but one of them found no parallel in any state constitution article six reads there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the said territory otherwise than in the punishment of crimes whereof the party shall have been duly convicted this has been hailed as a far-sighted humanitarian measure and it is quite true that many of the leading men in the south as well as in the north were looking forward to the time when slavery would be abolished but the motives predominating at the time were probably more nearly represented by grayson who wrote to james monroe three weeks after the ordinance was passed the clause respecting slavery was agreed to by the southern members for the purpose of preventing tobacco and indigo from being made on the northwest side of the ohio as well as for several other political reasons it is over one hundred and forty years since the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven was adopted during which period more than thirty territories of the united states have been organized and there has never been a time when one or more territories were not under congressional supervision so that the process of legislative control has been continuous changes have been made from time to time in order to adapt the territorial government to change conditions but for fifty years the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven actually remained in operation and even twenty years later it was specifically referred to by statute the principles of territorial government to-day are identical with those of seventeen eighty seven and those principles comprise the largest measure of local self-government compatible with national control a gradual extension of self-government to the people of a territory and finally complete statehood and admission into the union on a footing of equality with the other states 
in eighteen twenty five when the military occupation of oregon was suggested in congress senator dickerson of new jersey objected saying we have not adopted a system of colonization and it is to be hoped we never shall yet that is just what america has always had not only were the first settlers on the atlantic coast colonists from europe but the men who went to the frontier were also colonists from the atlantic seaboard and the men who settled the states in the west were colonists from the older communities the americans had so recently asserted their independence that they regarded the name of colony as not merely indicating dependence but as implying something of inferiority and even of reproach and when the american colonial system was being formulated in seventeen eighty three to eighty seven the word colony was not used the country under consideration was the region west of the allegheny mountains and in particular the territory north and west of the ohio river and being so referred to in the documents the word territory became the term applied to all the colonies the northwest territory increased so rapidly in population that in eighteen hundred it was divided into two districts and in eighteen o two the eastern part was admitted into the union as the state of ohio the rest of the territory was divided in eighteen o five and again in eighteen o nine indiana was admitted as a state in eighteen sixteen and illinois in eighteen eighteen so the process has gone on there were thirteen original states and six more have become members of the union without having been through the status of territories making nineteen in all while twenty-nine states have developed from the colonial stage the incorporation of the colonies into the union is not merely a political fact the inhabitants of the colonies become an integral part of the parent nation and in turn become the progenitors of new colonies if such a process be long continued the colonies will eventually outnumber the parent states and the colonists will outnumber the citizens of the original states and will themselves become the nation such has been the history of the united states and its people by eighteen fifty indeed one half of the population of the united states was living west of the allegheny mountains and at the present time approximately seventy per cent are to be found in the west the importance of the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven was hardly overstated by webster in his famous debate with hayne when he said we are accustomed to praise the lawgivers of antiquity we hope to perpetuate the fame of solon and lycurgus but i doubt whether one single law of any lawgiver ancient or modern has produced effects of more distinct marked and lasting character than the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven while improved means of communication and many other material ties have served to hold the states of the union together the political bond was supplied by the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven which inaugurated the american colonial system End of chapter four chapter five of the fathers of the constitution by max ferrand this librivox recording is in the public domain darkness before dawn john fisk summed up the prevailing impression of the government of the confederation in the title to his volume the critical period of american history the period of five years says fisk following the peace of seventeen eighty three was the most critical moment in all the history of the american people the dangers from which we were saved in seventeen eighty eight were even greater than were the dangers from which we were saved in eighteen sixty five perhaps the plight of the confederation was not so desperate as he would have us believe but it was desperate enough two incidents occurring between the signing of the preliminary terms of peace and the definitive treaty revealed the danger in which the country stood the main body of continental troops made up of militiamen and short-term volunteers always prone to mutinous conduct was collected at newburgh on the hudson watching the british in new york word might come at any day that the treaty had been signed and the army did not wish to be disbanded until certain matters had been settled primarily the question of their pay the officers had been promised half pay for life but nothing definite had been done toward carrying out the promise the soldiers had no such hope to encourage them and their pay was sadly in arrears in december seventeen eighty two the officers at newburgh drew up an address in behalf of themselves and their men and sent it to congress therein they made the threat thinly veiled of taking matters into their own hands unless their grievances were redressed 
there is reason to suppose that back of this movement or at least in sympathy with it were some of the strongest men in civil as in military life who while not fomenting insurrection were willing to bring pressure to bear on congress and the states congress was unable or unwilling to act and in march seventeen eighty three a second paper this time anonymous was circulated urging the men not to disband until the question of pay had been settled and recommending a meeting of officers on the following day if washington's influence was not counted upon it was at least hoped that he would not interfere but as soon as he learned of what had been done he issued general orders calling for a meeting of officers on a later day thus superseding the irregular meeting that had been suggested on the day appointed the commander-in-chief appeared and spoke with so much warmth and feeling that his little address drew tears from many of the officers he inveighed against the unsigned paper and against the methods that were talked of for they would mean the disgrace of the army and he appealed to the patriotism of the officers promising his best efforts in their behalf the effect was so strong that when washington withdrew resolutions were adopted unanimously expressing their loyalty and their faith in the justice of congress and denouncing the anonymous circular the general apprehension was not diminished by another incident in june some eighty troops of the pennsylvania line in camp at lancaster marched to philadelphia and drew up before the state house where congress was sitting their purpose was to demand better treatment and the payment of what was owed to them so far it was an orderly demonstration although not in keeping with military regulations in fact the men had broken away from camp under the lead of non-commissioned officers but when they had been stimulated by drink the disorder became serious the humiliating feature of the situation was that congress could do nothing even in self-protection they appealed to the pennsylvania authorities and when assistance was refused the members of congress in alarm fled in the night and three days later gathered in the college building in princeton congress became the butt of many jokes but men could not hide the chagrin they felt that their government was so weak the feeling deepened into shame when the helplessness of congress was displayed before the world weeks and even months passed before a quorum could be obtained to ratify the treaty recognizing the independence of the united states and establishing peace even after the treaty was supposed to be in force the states disregarded its provisions and congress could do nothing more than utter ineffective protests but most humiliating of all the british maintained their military posts within the northwestern territory ceded to the united states and congress could only request them to retire the americans pride was hurt and their pockets were touched as well for an important issue at stake was the control of the lucrative fur trade so resentment grew into anger but the british held on and the united states was powerless to make them withdraw to make matters worse the confederation for want of power to levy taxes was facing bankruptcy and congress was unable to devise ways and means to avert a crisis the second continental congress had come into existence in seventeen seventy five it was made up of delegations from the various colonies appointed in more or less irregular ways and had no more authority than it might assume and the various colonies were willing to concede yet it was the central body under which the revolution had been inaugurated and carried through to a successful conclusion had this congress grappled firmly with the financial problem and forced through a system of direct taxation the subsequent woes of the confederation might have been mitigated and perhaps averted in their enthusiasm over the declaration of independence the people by whom is meant the articulate class consisting largely of the governing and commercial elements would probably have accepted such a usurpation of authority but with their lack of experience it is not surprising that the delegates to congress did not appreciate the necessity of such radical action and so were unwilling to take the responsibility for it they counted upon the goodwill and support of their constituents which simmered down to a reliance upon voluntary grants from the states in response to appeals from congress these desultory grants proved to be so unsatisfactory that in seventeen eighty one even before the articles of confederation had been ratified 
congress asked for a grant of additional power to levy a duty of five per cent ad valorem upon all goods imported into the united states the revenue from which was to be applied to the discharge of the principal and interest on debts contracted for supporting the present war twelve states agreed but rhode island after some hesitation finally rejected the measure in november seventeen eighty two the articles of confederation authorized a system of requisitions apportioned among the several states in proportion to the value of all land within each state but as there was no power vested in congress to force the states to comply the situation was in no way improved when the articles were ratified and put into operation in fact matters grew worse as congress itself steadily lost ground in popular estimation until it had become little better than a laughing stock and with the ending of the war its requests were more honored in the breach than in the observance in seventeen eighty two congress asked for eight million dollars and the following year for two million dollars more but by the end of seventeen eighty three less than one million five hundred thousand dollars had been paid in in the same year seventeen eighty three congress made another attempt to remedy the financial situation by proposing the so-called revenue amendment according to which a specific duty was to be laid upon certain articles and a general duty of five per cent ad valorem upon all other goods to be in operation for twenty-five years in addition to this it was proposed that for the same period of time one million five hundred thousand dollars annually should be raised by requisitions and the definite amount for each state was specified until the rule of the confederation could be carried into practice it was then proposed that the article providing for the proportion of requisition should be changed so as to be based not upon land values but upon population in estimating which slaves should be counted at three-fifths of their number in the course of three years thereafter only two states accepted the proposals in full seven agreed to them in part and four failed to act at all congress in despair then made a further representation to the states upon the critical condition of the finances and accompanied this with an urgent appeal which resulted in all the states except new york agreeing to the proposed impost but the refusal of one state was sufficient to block the whole measure and there was no further hope for a treasury that was practically bankrupt in five years congress had received less than two and one half million dollars from requisitions and for the fourteen months ending january one seventeen eighty six the income was at the rate of less than three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars a year which was not enough as a committee of congress reported for the bare maintenance of the federal government on the most economical establishment and in time of profound peace in fact the income was not sufficient even to meet the interest on the foreign debt in the absence of other means of obtaining funds congress had resorted early to the unfortunate expedient of issuing paper money based solely on the good faith of the states to redeem it this fiat money held its value for some little time then it began to shrink and once started on the downward path its fall was rapid congress tried to meet the emergency by issuing paper in increasing quantities until the inevitable happened the paper money ceased to have any value and practically disappeared from circulation jefferson said that by the end of seventeen eighty one one thousand dollars of continental script was worth about one dollar in specie the states had already issued paper money of their own and their experience ought to have taught them a lesson but with the coming of hard times after the war they once more proposed by issuing paper to relieve the scarcity of money which was commonly supposed to be one of the principal evils of the day in seventeen eighty five and seventeen eighty six paper money parties appeared in almost all the states in some of these the conservative element was strong enough to prevent action but in others the movement had to run its fatal course the futility of what they were doing should have been revealed to all concerned by proposals seriously made that the paper money which was issued should depreciate at a regular rate each year until it should finally disappear the experience of rhode island is not to be regarded as typical of what was happening throughout the country but is indeed rather to be considered as exceptional yet it attracted widespread attention and revealed to anxious observers the dangers to which the country was subject if the existing condition of affairs were allowed to continue the machinery of the state government was captured by the paper money party in the spring election of seventeen eighty six the results were disappointing to the adherents of the paper money cause for when the money was issued depreciation began at once 
and those who tried to pay their bills discovered that a heavy discount was demanded in response to indignant demands the legislature of rhode island passed an act to force the acceptance of paper money under penalty and thereupon tradesmen refused to make any sales at all some closed their shops others tried to carry on business by exchange of wares the farmers then retaliated by refusing to sell their produce to the shopkeepers and general confusion and acute distress followed it was mainly a quarrel between the farmers and the merchants but it easily grew into a division between town and country and there followed a whole series of town meetings and county conventions the old line of cleavage was fairly well represented by the excommunication of a member of st john's episcopal church of providence for tendering bank-notes and the expulsion of a member of the society of the cincinnati for a similar cause the contest culminated in the case of trevitt v whedon seventeen eighty six which is memorable in the judicial annals of the united states the legislature not being satisfied with ordinary methods of enforcement had provided for the summary trial of offenders without a jury before a court whose judges were removable by the assembly and were therefore supposedly subservient to its wishes in the case in question the superior court boldly declared the enforcing act to be unconstitutional and for their contumacious behaviour the judges were summoned before the legislature they escaped punishment but only one of them was re-elected to office meanwhile disorders of a more serious sort which startled the whole country occurred in massachusetts it is doubtful if a satisfactory explanation ever will be found at least one which will be universally accepted as to the causes and origin of shays rebellion in seventeen eighty six some historians maintain that the uprising resulted primarily from a scarcity of money from a shortage in the circulating medium that while the eastern counties were keeping up their foreign trade sufficiently at least to bring in enough metallic currency to relieve the stringency and could also use various forms of credit the western counties had no such remedy others are inclined to think that the difficulties of the farmers in western massachusetts were caused largely by the return to normal conditions after the extraordinarily good times between seventeen seventy six and seventeen eighty and that it was the discomfort attending the process that drove them to revolt another explanation reminds one of present-day charges against undue influence of high financial circles when it is insinuated and even directly charged that the rebellion was fostered by conservative interests who were trying to create a public opinion in favour of a more strongly organised government whatever other causes there may have been the immediate source of trouble was the enforced payment of indebtedness which to a large extent had been allowed to remain in abeyance during the war this postponement of settlement had not been merely for humanitarian reasons it would have been the height of folly to collect when the currency was greatly depreciated but conditions were supposed to have been restored to normal with the cessation of hostilities and creditors were generally inclined to demand payment these demands coinciding with the heavy taxes drove the people of western massachusetts into revolt feeling ran high against lawyers who prosecuted suits for creditors and this antagonism was easily transferred to the courts in which the suits were brought the rebellion in massachusetts accordingly took the form of a demonstration against the courts a paper was carried from town to town in the county of worcester in which the signers promised to do their utmost to prevent the sitting of the inferior court of common pleas for the county or of any other court that should attempt to take property by distress the massachusetts legislature adjourned in july seventeen eighty six without remedying the trouble and also without authorizing an issue of paper money which the hard-pressed debtors were demanding in the months following mobs prevented the courts from sitting in various towns a special session of the legislature was then called by the governor but when that special session had adjourned on the eighteenth of november it might just as well have never met he had attempted to remedy various grievances and had made concessions to the malcontents but it had also passed measures to strengthen the hands of the governor this only seemed to inflame the rioters after the lower courts a move was made against the state supreme court and plans were laid for a concerted movement against the cities in the eastern part of the state civil war seemed imminent the insurgents were led by daniel shays an officer in the army of the revolution and the party of law and order was represented by governor james bowdoin who raised some four thousand troops and placed them under the command of general benjamin lincoln 
the time of year was unfortunate for the insurgents especially as december was unusually cold and there was a heavy snowfall shays could not provide stores and equipment and was unable to maintain discipline a threatened attack on cambridge came to naught for when preparations were made to protect the city the rebels began a disorderly retreat and in the intense cold and deep snow they suffered severely and many died from exposure the centre of interest then shifted to springfield where the insurgents were attempting to seize the united states arsenal the local militia had already repelled the first attacks and the appearance of general lincoln with his troops completed the demoralization of shays army the insurgents retreated but lincoln pursued relentlessly and broke them up into small bands which then wandered about the country preying upon the unfortunate inhabitants when spring came most of them had been subdued or had been taken refuge in the neighboring states shays rebellion was fairly easily suppressed even though it required the shedding of some blood but it was the possibility of further outbreaks that destroyed men's peace of mind there were similar disturbances in other states and there the massachusetts insurgents found sympathy support and finally a refuge when the worst was over and governor bodewin applied to the neighboring states for help in capturing the last of the refugees rhode island and vermont failed to respond to the extent that might have been expected of them the danger therefore of the insurrection spreading was a cause of deep concern this feeling was increased by the impotence of congress the government had sufficient excuse for intervention after the attack upon the national arsenal in springfield congress indeed began to raise troops but did not dare to admit its purpose and offered as a pretext an expedition against the northwestern indians the rebellion was over before any assistance could be given the inefficiency of congress and its lack of influence were evident like the disorders in rhode island shays rebellion in massachusetts helped to bring about a reaction and strengthen the conservative movement for reform these untoward happenings however were only symptoms the causes of the trouble lay far deeper this fact was recognized even in rhode island for at least one of the conventions had passed resolutions declaring that in considering the condition of the whole country what particularly concerned them was the condition of trade paradoxical as it may seem the trade and commerce of the country were already on the upward grade and prosperity was actually returning but prosperity is usually a process of slow growth and is seldom recognized by the community at large until it is well established far-sighted men forecast the coming of good times in advance of the rest of the community and prosper accordingly the majority of the people know that prosperity has come only when it is unmistakably present and some are not aware of it until it has begun to go if that be true in our day much more was it true in the eighteenth century when means of communication were so poor that it took days for a message to go from boston to new york and weeks for news to get from boston to charleston it was a period of adjustment and as we look back after the event we can see that the american people were adapting themselves with remarkable skill to the new conditions but that was not so evident to the men who were feeling the pinch of hard times and when all the attendant circumstances some of which have been described are taken into account it is not surprising that commercial depression should be one of the strongest influences in and the immediate occasion of bringing men to the point of willingness to attempt some radical changes the fact needs to be reiterated that the people of the united states were largely dependent upon agriculture and other forms of extractive industry and that markets for the disposal of their goods were an absolute necessity some of the states especially new england and the middle states were interested in the carrying trade but all were concerned in obtaining markets on account of jealousy interstate trade continued a precarious existence and by no means sufficed to dispose of the surplus products so that foreign markets were necessary the people were especially concerned for the establishment of the old trade with the west india islands which had been the mainstay of their prosperity in colonial times and after the british government in seventeen eighty three restricted that trade to british vessels many people in the united states were attributing hard times to british malignancy the only action which seemed possible was to force great britain in particular but other foreign countries as well to make such trade agreements as the prosperity of the united states demanded the only hope seemed to lie in a commercial policy of reprisal which would force other countries to open their markets to american goods retaliation was the dominating idea in the foreign policy of the time so in seventeen eighty four congress made a new recommendation to the states prefacing it with an assertion of the importance of commerce saying the fortune of every citizen is interested in the success thereof for it is the constant source of wealth and incentive to industry 
and the value of our produce and our land must ever rise or fall in proportion to the prosperous or adverse state of trade and after declaring that great britain had adopted regulations destructive of our commerce with her west india islands it was further asserted unless the united states in congress assembled shall be vested with powers competent to the protection of commerce they can never command reciprocal advantages in trade it was therefore proposed to give to congress for fifteen years the power to prohibit the importation or exportation of goods at american ports except in vessels owned by the people of the united states or by the subjects of foreign governments having treaties of commerce with the united states this was simply a request for authorization to adopt navigation acts but the individual states were too much concerned with their own interests and did not or would not appreciate the rights of the other states or the interests of the union as a whole and so the commercial amendment of seventeen eighty four suffered the fate of all other amendments proposed to the articles of confederation in fact only two states accepted it it usually happens that some minor occurrence almost unnoticed at the time leads directly to the most important consequences and an incident in domestic affairs started the chain of events in the united states that ended in the reform of the federal government the rivalry and jealousy among the states had brought matters to such a pass that either congress must be vested with adequate powers or the confederation must collapse but the articles of confederation provided no remedy and it had been found that amendments to that instrument could not be obtained it was necessary therefore to proceed in some extra-legal fashion the articles of confederation specifically forbade treaties or alliances between the states unless approved by congress yet virginia and maryland in seventeen eighty five had come to a working agreement regarding the use of the potomac river which was the boundary line between them commissioners representing both parties had met at alexandria and soon adjourned to mount vernon where they not only reached an amicable settlement of the immediate questions before them but also discussed the larger subjects of duties and commercial matters in general when the maryland legislature came to act on the report it proposed that pennsylvania and delaware should be invited to join with them in formulating a common commercial policy virginia then went one step farther and invited all the other states to send commissioners to a general trade convention and later announced annapolis as the place of meeting and set the time for september seventeen eighty six this action was unconstitutional and was so recognized for james madison notes that from the legislative journals of virginia it appears that a vote to apply for a sanction of congress was followed by a vote against the communication of the compact to congress and he mentions other similar violations of the central authority that this did not attract more attention was probably due to the public interest being absorbed just at that time by the paper money agitation then to the men concerned seem to have been willing to avoid publicity their purposes are well brought out in a letter of m louis otto french charge d'affaires written on october tenth seventeen eighty six to the comte de vergen minister for foreign affairs though their motives may be somewhat misinterpreted although there are no nobles in america there is a class of men denominated gentlemen who by reason of their wealth their talents their education their families or the offices they hold aspire to a pre-eminence which the people refuse to grant them and although many of these men have betrayed the interests of their order to gain popularity there reigns among them a connection so much the more intimate as they almost all of them dread the efforts of the people to despoil them of their possessions and moreover they are creditors and therefore interested in strengthening the government and watching over the execution of the laws these men generally pay very heavy taxes while the small proprietors escape the vigilance of the collectors the majority of them being merchants it is for their interest to establish the credit of the united states in europe on a solid foundation by the exact payment of debts and to grant to congress powers extensive enough to compel the people to contribute for this purpose the attempt my lord has been vain by pamphlets and other publications to spread notions of justice and integrity and to deprive the people of a freedom which they have so misused by proposing a new organization of the federal government all minds would have been revolted circumstances ruinous to the commerce of america have happily arisen to furnish the reformers with a pretext for introducing innovations they represented to the people that the american name had become opprobrious among all the nations of europe that the flag of the united states was everywhere exposed to insults and annoyance the husbandman no longer able to export his produce freely would soon be reduced to want it was high time to retaliate and to convince foreign powers that the united states would not with impunity suffer such a violation of the freedom of trade but that strong measures could be taken only with the consent of the thirteen states 
and that congress not having the necessary powers it was essential to form a general assembly instructed to present to congress the plan for its adoption and to point out the means of carrying it into execution the people generally discontented with the obstacles in the way of commerce and scarcely suspecting the secret motives of their opponents ardently embraced this measure and appointed commissioners who were to assemble at annapolis in the beginning of september the authors of this proposition had no hope nor even desire to see the success of this assembly of commissioners which was only intended to prepare a question much more important than that of commerce the measures were so well taken that at the end of september no more than five states were represented at annapolis and the commissioners from the northern states tarried several days at new york in order to retard their arrival the states which assembled after having waited nearly three weeks separated under the pretext that they were not in sufficient numbers to enter on business and to justify this dissolution they addressed to the different legislatures and to congress a report the translation of which i have the honor to enclose to you among these men denominated gentlemen to whom the french charge d'affaires alludes was james madison of virginia he was one of the younger men unfitted by temperament and physique to be a soldier who yet had found his opportunity in the revolution graduating in seventeen seventy one from princeton where tradition tells of the party took in patriotic demonstrations on the campus characteristic of students then as now he had thrown himself heart and soul into the american cause he was a member of the convention to frame the first state constitution for virginia in seventeen seventy six and from that time on because of his ability he was an important figure in the political history of his state and of his country he was largely responsible for bringing about the conference between virginia and maryland and for the subsequent steps resulting in the trade convention at annapolis and yet madison seldom took a conspicuous part preferring to remain in the background and to allow others to appear as the leaders when the annapolis convention assembled for example he suffered alexander hamilton of new york to play the leading role hamilton was then approaching thirty years of age and was one of the ablest men in the united states though his best work was done in later years when he proved himself to be perhaps the most brilliant of american statesmen with an extraordinary genius for administrative organization the part that he took in the affairs of this period was important he was small and slight in person but with an expressive face fair complexion and cheeks of almost feminine rosiness the usual aspect of the, his countenance was thoughtful and even severe but in conversation his face lighted up with a remarkably attractive smile he carried himself erectly and with dignity so that in spite of his small figure when he entered a room it was apparent from the respectful attention of the company that he was a distinguished person a contemporary speaking of the opposite and almost irreconcilable traits of hamilton's character pronounced a bust of him as giving a complete exposition of his character draw a handkerchief around the mouth of the bust and the remnant of the countenance represents fortitude and intrepidity such as we have often seen in the plates of roman heroes veil in the same manner the face and leave the mouth and chin only discernible and all this fortitude melts and vanishes into almost feminine softness hamilton was a leading spirit in the annapolis trade convention and wrote the report that it adopted whether or not there is any truth in the assertion of the french charge that hamilton and others thought it advisable to disguise their purposes there is no doubt that the annapolis convention was an all-important step in the progress of reform and its recommendation was the direct occasion for the calling of the great convention that framed the constitution of the united states the recommendation of the annapolis delegates was in the form of a report to the legislatures of their respective states in which they referred to the defects in the federal government and called for a convention of deputies from the different states for the special purpose of entering into this investigation and digesting a plan for supplying such defects philadelphia was suggested as the place of meeting and the time was fixed for the second monday of may of the next year several other states acted promptly upon this recommendation and in february seventeen eighty seven congress adopted a resolution accepting the proposal and calling the convention for the sole and express purpose of revising the articles of confederation and reporting such alterations as shall render the federal constitution adequate to the exigencies of government and the preservation of the union before the time fixed for the meeting of the philadelphia convention or shortly after that date all the states had appointed deputies with the exception of new hampshire and rhode island new hampshire was favorably disposed toward the meeting but owing to local conditions failed to act before the convention was well under way delegates however arrived in time to share in some of the most important proceedings rhode island alone refused to take part although a letter signed by some of the prominent men was sent to the convention pledging their support End of chapter five
chapter six of the fathers of the constitution by max Brand. this librivox recording is in the public domain the federalist convention the body of delegates which met in philadelphia in seventeen eighty seven was the most important convention that ever sat in the united states the confederation was a failure and if the new nation was to be justified in the eyes of the world it must show itself capable of effective union the members of the convention realized the significance of the task before them which was as madison said now to decide forever the fate of republican government governor morris with unwonted seriousness declared the whole human race will be affected by the proceedings of this convention james wilson spoke with equal gravity after the lapse of six thousand years since the creation of the world america now presents the first instance of a people assembled to weigh deliberately and calmly and to decide leisurely and peaceably upon the form of government by which they will bind themselves and their posterity not all the men to whom this undertaking was entrusted and who were taking themselves and their work so seriously could pretend to social distinction but practically all belonged to the upper ruling class at the indian queen a tavern on fourth street between market and chestnut some of the delegates had a hall in which they lived by themselves the meetings of the convention were held in an upper room of the state house the sessions were secret sentries were placed at the door to keep away all intruders and the pavement of the street in front of the building was covered with loose earth so that the noises of passing traffic should not disturb this august assembly it is not surprising that a tradition grew up about the federal convention which hedged it round with a sort of awe and reverence even thomas jefferson referred to it as an assembly of demigods if we can get away from the glamour which has been spread over the work of the fathers of the constitution and understand that they were human beings even as we are and influenced by the same motives as other men it may be possible to obtain a more faithful impression of what actually took place since representation in the convention was to be by states just as it had been in the continental congress the presence of delegations from a majority of the states was necessary for organization it is a commentary upon the times upon the difficulties of travel and upon the leisurely habits of the people that the meeting which had been called for the fourteenth of may could not begin its work for over ten days the twenty fifth of may was stormy and only twenty-nine delegates were on hand when the convention organized the slender attendance can only partially be attributed to the weather for in the following three months and a half of the convention at which fifty-five members were present at one time or another the average attendance was only slightly larger than that of the first day in such a small body personality counted for much in ways that the historian can only surmise many compromises of conflicting interests were reached by informal discussion outside of the formal sessions in these small gatherings individual character was often as decisive as weighty argument george washington was unanimously chosen as the presiding officer of the convention he sat on a raised platform in a large carved high-backed chair from which his commanding figure and dignified bearing exerted a potent influence on the assembly an influence enhanced by the formal courtesy and stately intercourse of the times washington was the great man of his day and the members not only respected and admired him some of them were actually afraid of him when he rose to his feet he was almost the commander-in-chief again there is evidence to show that his support or disapproval was at times a decisive factor in the deliberations of the convention virginia which had taken a conspicuous part in the calling of the convention was looked to for leadership in the work that was to be done james madison next to washington the most important member of the virginia delegation was the very opposite of washington in many respects small and slight in stature inconspicuous in dress as in figure modest and retiring but with a quick active mind and wide knowledge obtained both from experience in public affairs and from extensive reading washington was the man of action madison the scholar in politics madison was the younger by nearly twenty years but washington admired him greatly and gave him the support of his influence a matter of no little consequence for madison was the leading expert worker of the convention in the business of framing the constitution governor edmund randolph with his tall figure handsome face and dignified manner 
made an excellent impression in the position accorded to him of nominal leader of the virginia delegation among others from the same state who should be noticed were the famous lawyers george with and george mason among the deputies from pennsylvania the foremost was james wilson the caledonian who probably stood next in importance in the convention to madison and washington he had come to america as a young man just when the troubles with england were beginning and by sheer ability had attained a position of prominence several times a member of congress a signer of the declaration of independence he was now regarded as one of the ablest lawyers in the united states a more brilliant member of the pennsylvania delegation and one of the most brilliant of the convention was governor morris who shone by his cleverness and quick wit as well as by his wonderful command of language the morris was admired more than he was trusted and while he supported the efforts for a strong government his support was not always as great a help as might have been expected a crippled arm and a wooden leg might detract from his personal appearance but they could not subdue his spirit and audacity there were other prominent members of the pennsylvania delegation but none of them took an important part in the convention not even the aged benjamin franklin president of the state at the age of eighty-one his powers were failing and he was so feeble that his colleague wilson read his speeches for him his opinions were respected but they do not seem to have carried much weight other noteworthy members of the convention though hardly in the first class were the handsome and charming rufus king of massachusetts one of the coming men of the country and nathaniel gorham of the same state who was president of congress a man of good sense rather than of great ability but one whose reputation was high and whose presence was a distinct asset to the convention then too there were the delegates from south carolina john rutledge the orator general charles coatsworth pinckney of revolutionary fame and his cousin charles pinckney the last name took a conspicuous part in the proceedings in philadelphia but so far as the outcome was concerned left his mark on the constitution mainly in minor matters and details the men who have been named were nearly all supporters of the plan for a centralized government on the other side were william patterson of new jersey who had been attorney general of his state for eleven years and who was respected for his knowledge and ability john dickinson of delaware the author of the farmer's letters and chairman of the committee of congress that had framed the articles of confederation able scholarly and sincere but nervous sensitive and conscientious to the verge of timidity whose refusal to sign the declaration of independence had caused him his popularity though he was afterward returned to congress and became president successively of delaware and of pennsylvania elbridge gary of massachusetts a successful merchant prominent in politics and greatly interested in questions of commerce and finance and the connecticut delegates forming an unusual trio dr william samuel johnson roger sherman and oliver ellsworth these men were fearful of establishing too strong a government and were at one time or another to be found in opposition to madison and his supporters they were not mere obstructionists however and while not constructive in the same way that madison and wilson were they must be given some credit for the form which the constitution finally assumed their greatest service was in restraining the tendency of the majority to overrule the rights of states and in modifying the desires of individuals for a government that would have been too strong to work well in practice alexander hamilton of new york as one of the ablest members of the convention was expected to take an important part but he was out of touch with the views of the majority he was aristocratic rather than democratic and however excellent his ideas may have been they were too radical for his fellow delegates and found but little support he threw his strength in favor of a strong government and was ready to aid the movement in whatever way he could but within his own delegation he was outvoted by robert yates and john lansing and before the sessions were half over he was deprived of a vote by the withdrawal of his colleagues thereupon finding himself of little service he went to new york and returned to philadelphia only once or twice for a few days at a time and finally to sign the completed document luther martin of maryland was an able lawyer and the attorney-general of his state but he was supposed to be allied with undesirable interests and it was said that he had been sent to the convention for the purpose of opposing a strong government he proved to be a tiresome speaker and his prosiness when added to the suspicion attaching to his motives cost him much of the influence which he might otherwise have had all in all the delegates to the federal convention were a remarkable body of men most of them had played important parts in the drama of the revolution three-fourths of them had served in congress and practically all were persons of note in their respective states and had held important public positions they may not have been the assembly of demigods which jefferson called them 
for another contemporary insisted that twenty assemblies of equal number might be collected equally respectable both in point and of ability integrity and patriotism perhaps it would be safer to regard the convention as a fairly representative body which was of a somewhat higher order than would be gathered together to-day because the social conditions of those days tended to bring forward men of a better class and because the seriousness of the crisis had called out leaders of the highest type two or three days were consumed in organizing the convention electing officers considering the delegates credentials and adopting rules of procedure and when these necessary preliminaries had been accomplished the main business was opened with the presentation by the virginia delegation of a series of resolutions providing for radical changes in the machinery of the confederation the principal features were the organization of a legislature of two houses proportional to population and with increased powers the establishment of a separate executive and the creation of an independent judiciary this was in reality providing for a new government and was probably quite beyond the ideas of most of the members of the convention who had come there under instructions and with the expectation of revising the articles of confederation but after the virginia plan had been the subject of discussion for two weeks so that the members had become a little more accustomed to its proposals and after minor modifications had been made in the wording of the resolutions the convention was won over to its support to check this drift toward radical change the opposition headed by new jersey and connecticut presented the so-called new jersey plan which was in sharp contrast to the virginia resolutions for it contemplated only a revision of the articles of confederation but after a relatively short discussion the virginia plan was adopted by a vote of seven states against four with one state divided the dividing line between the two parties or groups in the convention had quickly manifested itself it proved to be the same line that had divided the congress of the confederation the cleavage between the large states and the small states the large states were in favor of representation in both houses of the legislature according to population while the small states were opposed to any change which would deprive them of their equal vote in congress and though outvoted they were not ready to yield the virginia plan and subsequently the new jersey plan had first been considered in committee of the whole and the question of proportional representation as it was then called would accordingly come up again in formal session several weeks had been occupied by the proceedings so that it was now near the end of june and in general the discussions had been conducted with remarkably good temper but it was evidently the calm before the storm and the issue was finally joined when the question of representation in the two houses again came before the convention the majority of the states on the twenty ninth of june once more voted in favor of proportional representation in the lower house but on the question of the upper house owing to a peculiar combination of circumstances the absence of one delegate and another's change of vote causing the position of their respective states to be reversed or nullified the vote on the second of july resulted in a tie this brought the proceedings of the convention to a standstill a committee of one member from each state was appointed to consider the question and that time might be given to the committee and to such as chose to attend to the celebration on the anniversary of independence the convention adjourned over the fourth the committee was chosen by ballot and its composition was a clear indication that the small state men had won their fight and that a compromise would be effected it was during the debate upon this subject when feeling was running high and when at times it seemed as if the convention in default of any satisfactory solution would permanently adjourn that franklin proposed that prayers imploring the assistance of heaven be held in this assembly every morning tradition relates that hamilton opposed the motion the members were evidently afraid of the impression which would be created outside if it were suspected that there were dissensions in the convention and the motion was not put to a vote how far physical conditions may influence men in adopting any particular course of action it is impossible to say but just when the discussion in the convention reached a critical stage just when the compromise presented by the committee was ready for adoption or rejection the weather turned from unpleasantly hot to being comfortably cool and after some little time spent in the consideration of details on the sixteenth of july the great compromise of the constitution was adopted there was no other that compared with it in importance its most significant features were that in the upper house each state should have an equal vote and that in the lower house representation should be apportioned on the basis of population while direct taxation should follow the same proportion the further proviso that money bills should originate in the lower house and should not be amended in the upper house was regarded by some delegates as of considerable importance though others did not think so and eventually the restriction 
upon amendment by the upper house was dropped there has long been a prevailing belief that an essential feature of the great compromise was the counting of only three-fifths of the slaves in enumerating the population this impression is quite erroneous it was one of the details of the compromise but it had been a feature of the revenue amendment of seventeen eighty three and it was generally accepted as a happy solution of the difficulty that slaves possessed the attributes both of persons and of property it had been included both in the amended virginia plan and in the new jersey plan and when it was embodied in the compromise it was described as the ratio recommended by congress in their resolutions of april eighteen seventeen eighty three a few months later in explaining the matter to the massachusetts convention rufus king said that this rule was adopted because it was the language of all america in reality the three-fifths rule was a mere incident in that part of the great compromise which declared that representation should be proportioned according to direct taxation as a further indication of the attitude of the convention upon this point an amendment to have blacks counted equally with the whites was voted down by eight states against two with the adoption of the great compromise a marked difference was noticeable in the attitude of the delegates those from the large states were deeply disappointed at the result and they asked for an adjournment to give them time to consider what they should do the next morning before the convention met they held a meeting to determine upon their course of action they were apparently afraid of taking the responsibility for breaking up the convention so they finally decided to let the proceedings go on and to see what might be the ultimate outcome rumors of these dissensions had reached the ears of the public and it may have been to quiet any misgivings that the following inspired item appeared in several local papers so great is the unanimity we hear that prevails in the convention upon all great federal subjects that it has been proposed to call the room in which they assemble unanimity hall on the other hand the effect of this great compromise upon the delegates from the small states was distinctly favorable having obtained equal representation in one branch of the legislature they now proceeded with much greater willingness to consider the strengthening of the central government many details were yet to be arranged and sharp differences of opinion existed in connection with the executive as well as with the judiciary but these difficulties were slight in comparison with those which they had already surmounted in the matter of representation by the end of july the fifteen resolutions the original virginia plan had been increased to twenty-three with many enlargements and amendments and the convention had gone as far as it could effectively in determining the general principles upon which the government should be formed there were too many members to work efficiently when it came to the actual framing of a constitution with all the inevitable details that were necessary in setting up a machinery of government accordingly this task was turned over to a committee of five members who had already given evidence of their ability in this direction rutledge was made the chairman and the others were randolph gorham ellsworth and wilson to give them time to perfect their work on the twenty sixth of july the convention adjourned for ten days End of chapter six chapter seven of the fathers of the constitution by max ferrand this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven finishing the work rutledge and his associates on the committee of detail accomplished so much in such a short time that it seems as if they must have worked day and night their efforts marked a distinct stage in the development of the constitution the committee left no records but some of the members retained among their private papers drafts of the different stages of the report they were framing and we are therefore able to surmise the way in which the committee proceeded of course the members were bound by the resolutions which had been adopted by the convention and they held themselves closely to the general principles that had been laid down but in the elaboration of details they seem to have begun with the articles of confederation and to have used all of that document that was consistent with the new plan of government then they made use of the new jersey plan which had been put forward by the smaller states and of a third plan which had been presented by charles pinckney for the rest they drew largely upon the state constitutions by a combination of these different sources the committee prepared a document bearing a close resemblance to the present constitution although subjects were in a different order 
and in somewhat different proportions which at the end of ten days by working on sunday they were able to present to the convention this draft of a constitution was printed on seven folio pages with wide margins for notes and emendations the convention resumed its sessions on monday the sixth of august and for five weeks the report of the committee of detail was the subject of discussion for five hours each day and sometimes for six hours the delegates kept persistently at their task it was midsummer and we read in the diary of one of the members that in all that period only five days were cool item by item line by line the printed draft of the constitution was considered it is not possible nor is it necessary to follow that work minutely much of it was purely formal and yet any one who has had experience with committee reports knows how much importance attaches to matters of phrasing just as the virginia plan was made more acceptable to the majority by changes in wording that seemed to us insignificant so modifications in phrasing slowly won support for the draft of the constitution the adoption of the great compromise as we have seen changed the whole spirit of the convention there was now an expectation on the part of the members that something definite was going to be accomplished and all were concerned in making the result as good and as acceptable as possible in other words the spirit of compromise pervaded every action and it is essential to remember this in considering what was accomplished one of the greatest weaknesses of the confederation was the inefficiency of congress more than four pages or three-fifths of the whole printed draft were devoted to congress and its powers it is more significant however that in the new constitution the legislative powers of the confederation were transferred bodily to the congress of the united states and that the powers added were few in number although of course of the first importance the virginia plan declared that in addition to the powers under the confederation congress should have the right to legislate in all cases to which the separate states are incompetent this statement was elaborated in the printed draft which granted specific powers of taxation of regulating commerce of establishing a uniform rule of naturalization and at the end of the enumeration of powers two clauses were added giving to congress authority to call forth the aid of the militia in order to execute the laws of the union enforce treaties suppress insurrections and repel invasions and to make all laws that shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers on the other hand it was necessary to place some limitations upon the power of congress a general restriction was laid by giving to the executive a right of veto which might be overruled however by a two-thirds vote of both houses following british tradition yielding as it were to an inherited fear these delegates in america were led to place the first restraint upon the exercise of congressional authority in connection with treason the legislature of the united states was given the power to declare the punishment of treason but treason itself was defined in the constitution and it was further asserted that a person could be convicted of treason only on the testimony of two witnesses and that attainder of treason should not work corruption of blood nor forfeiture except during the life of the person attainted arising more nearly out of their own experience was the prohibition of export taxes of capitation taxes and of the granting of titles of nobility while the committee of detail was preparing its report the southern members of that committee had succeeded in getting a provision inserted that navigation acts could be passed only by a two-thirds vote of both houses of the legislature new england and the middle states were strongly in favor of navigation acts for if they could require all american products to be carried in american-built and american-owned vessels they would give a great stimulus to the shipbuilding and commerce of the united states they therefore wished to give congress power 
in this matter on exactly the same terms that other powers were granted the south however was opposed to this policy for it wanted to encourage the cheapest method of shipping its raw materials the south also wanted a larger number of slaves to meet its labor demands to this need new england was not favorably disposed to reconcile the conflicting interests of the two sections a compromise was finally reached the requirement of a two-thirds vote of both houses for the passing of navigation acts which the southern members had obtained was abandoned and on the other hand it was determined that congress should not be allowed to interfere with the importation of slaves for twenty years this again was one of the important and conspicuous compromises of the constitution it is liable however to be misunderstood for one should not read into the sentiment of the members of the convention any of the later strong prejudice against slavery there were some who objected on moral grounds to the recognition of slavery in the constitution and that word was carefully avoided by referring to such persons as any states now existing shall think proper to admit and there were some who were especially opposed to the encouragement of that institution by permitting the slave trade but the majority of the delegates regarded slavery as an accepted institution as a part of the established order and public sentiment on the slave trade was not much more emphatic and positive than it is now on cruelty to animals as ellsworth said the morality or wisdom of slavery are considerations belonging to the states themselves and the compromise was nothing more or less than a bargain between the sections the fundamental weakness of the confederation was the inability of the government to enforce its decrees and in spite of the increased powers of congress even including the use of the militia to execute the laws of the union it was not felt that this defect had been entirely remedied experience under the confederation had taught men that something more was necessary in the direction of restricting the states in matters which might interfere with the working of the central government as in the case of the powers of congress the articles of confederation were again resorted to and the restrictions which had been placed upon the states in that document were now embodied in the constitution with modifications and additions but the final touch was given in connection with the judiciary there was little in the printed draft and there is comparatively little in the constitution on the subject of the judiciary a federal supreme court was provided for and congress was permitted but not required to establish inferior courts while the jurisdiction of these tribunals was determined upon the general principles that it should extend to cases arising under the constitution and laws of the united states to treaties and cases in which foreigners and foreign countries were involved and to controversies between states and citizens of different states nowhere in the document itself is there any word as to that great power which has been exercised by the federal courts of declaring null and void laws or parts of laws that are regarded as in contravention to the constitution there is little doubt that the more important men in the convention such as wilson madison gouverneur morris king gary mason and luther martin believed that the judiciary would exercise this power even though it should not be specifically granted the nearest approach to a declaration of this power is to be found in a paragraph that was inserted toward the end of the constitution oddly enough this was a modification of a clause introduced by luther martin with quite another intent as adopted it reads that this constitution and the laws of the united states and all treaties shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding this paragraph may well be regarded as the keystone of the constitutional arch of national power its significance lies in the fact that the constitution is regarded not as a treaty nor as an agreement between states but as a law and while its enforcement is backed by armed power it is a law enforceable in the courts one whole division of the constitution has been as yet barely referred to and it not only presented one of the most perplexing problems which the convention faced but one of the last to be settled that providing for an executive there was a general agreement in the convention that there should be a separate executive 
the opinion also developed quite early that a single executive was better than a plural body but that was as far as the members could go with any degree of unanimity at the outset they seemed to have thought that the executive would be dependent upon the legislature appointed by that body and therefore more or less subject to its control but in the course of the proceedings the tendency was to grant greater and greater powers to the executive in other words he was becoming a figure of importance no such office as that of president of the united states was then in existence it was a new position which they were creating we have become so accustomed to it that it is difficult for us to hark back to the time when there was no such officer and to realize the difficulties and the fears of the men who were responsible for creating that office the presidency was obviously modeled after the governorship of the individual states and yet the incumbent was to be at the head of the thirteen states rufus king is frequently quoted to the effect that the men of that time had been accustomed to considering themselves subjects of the british king even at the time of the convention there is good evidence to show that some of the members were still agitating the desirability of establishing a monarchy in the united states it was a common rumor that a son of george the third was to be invited to come over and there is reason to believe that only a few months before the convention met prince henry of prussia was approached by prominent people in this country to see if he could be induced to accept the headship of the states that is to become the king of the united states the members of the convention evidently thought that they were establishing something like a monarchy as randolph said the people would see the form at least of a little monarch and they did not want him to have despotic powers when the sessions were over a lady asked franklin well doctor what have we got a republic or a monarchy a republic replied the doctor if you can keep it the increase of powers accruing to the executive office necessitated placing a corresponding check upon the exercise of those powers the obvious method was to render the executive subject to impeachment and it was also readily agreed that his veto might be overruled by a two-thirds vote of congress but some further safeguards were necessary and the whole question accordingly turned upon the method of his election and the length of his term in the course of the proceedings of the convention at several different times the members voted in favor of an appointment by the national legislature but they also voted against it once they voted for a system of electors chosen by the state legislatures and twice they voted against such a system three times they voted to reconsider the whole question it is no wonder that gary should say we seem to be entirely at a loss so it came to the end of august with most of the other matters disposed of and with the patience of the delegates worn out by the long strain of four weeks close application during the discussions it had become apparent to every one that an election of the president by the people would give a decided advantage to the large states so that again there was arising the divergence between the large and small states in order to hasten matters to a conclusion this and all other vexing details upon which the convention could not agree were turned over to a committee made up of a member from each state it was this committee which pointed the way to a compromise by which the choice of the executive was to be entrusted to electors chosen in each state as its legislature might direct the electors were to be equal in number to the state's representation in congress including both senators and representatives and in each state they were to meet and to vote for two persons one of whom should not be an inhabitant of that state the votes were to be listed and sent to congress and the person who had received the greatest number of votes was to be president provided such a number was a majority of all the electors in case of a tie the senate was to choose between the candidates and if no one had a majority the senate was to elect from the five highest on the list this method of voting would have given the large states a decided advantage of course in that they would appoint the greater number of electors but it was not believed that this system would ordinarily result in a majority of votes being cast for one man apparently no one anticipated the formation of political parties which would concentrate the votes upon one or another candidate it was rather expected that in the great majority of cases nineteen times in twenty one of the delegates said there would be several candidates and that the selection from those candidates would fall to the senate in which all the states were equally represented and the small states were in the majority but since the senate shared so many powers with the executive 
it seemed better to transfer the right of eventual election to the house of representatives where each state was still to have but one vote had this scheme worked as the designers expected the interests of large states and small states would have been reconciled since in effect the large states would name the candidates and nineteen times in twenty the small states would choose from among them apparently the question of a third term was never considered by the delegates in the convention the chief problem before them was the method of election if the president was to be chosen by the legislature he should not be eligible to re-election on the other hand if there was to be some form of popular election an opportunity for re-election was thought to be a desirable incentive to good behaviour six or seven years was taken as an acceptable length for a single term and four years a convenient tenure if re-election was permitted it was upon these considerations that the term of four years was eventually agreed upon with no restriction placed upon re-election when it was believed that a satisfactory method of choosing the president had been discovered and it is interesting to notice the members of the convention later congratulated themselves that at least this feature of their government was above criticism it was decided to give still further powers to the president such as the making of treaties and the appointing of ambassadors and judges although the advice and consent of the senate was required and in the case of treaties two-thirds of the members present must consent the presidency was frankly an experiment the success of which would depend largely upon the first election yet no one seems to have been anxious about the first choice of chief magistrate and the reason is not far to seek from the moment the members agreed that there should be a single executive they also agreed upon the man for the position just as washington had been chosen unanimously to preside over the convention so it was generally accepted that he would be the first head of the new state such at least was the trend of conversation and even of debate on the floor of the convention it indicates something of the conception of the office prevailing at the time that washington when he became president is said to have preferred the title his high mightiness the president of the united states and protector of their liberties the members of the convention were plainly growing tired and there are evidences of haste in the work of the last few days there was a tendency to ride roughshod over those whose temperaments forced them to demand modifications in petty matters this precipitancy gave rise to considerable dissatisfaction and led several delegates to declare that they would not sign the completed document but on the whole the sentiment of the convention was overwhelmingly favourable accordingly on saturday the eighth of september a new committee was appointed to consist of five members whose duty it was to revise the style of and arrange the articles which had been agreed to by the house the committee was chosen by ballot and was made up exclusively of friends of the new constitution dr johnson of connecticut alexander hamilton who had returned to philadelphia to help in finishing the work gouverneur morris james madison and rufus king on wednesday the twelfth the committee made its report the greatest credit for which is probably to be given to morris whose powers of expression were so greatly admired another day was spent in waiting for the report to be printed but on thursday this was ready and three days were devoted to going over carefully each article and section and giving the finishing touches by saturday the work of the convention was brought to a close and the constitution was then ordered to be engrossed on monday the seventeenth of september the convention met for the last time a few of those present being unwilling to sign gouverneur morris again cleverly devised a form which would make the action appear to be unanimous done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names thirty-nine delegates representing twelve states then signed the constitution when charles biddle of philadelphia who was acquainted with most of the members of the convention wrote his autobiography which was published in eighteen o two he declared that for his part he considered the government established by the constitution to be the best in the world and as perfect as any human form of government can be but he prefaced that declaration with a statement that some of the best informed members of the federal convention had told him they did not believe a single member was perfectly satisfied with the constitution but they believed it was the best they could ever agree upon and that it was infinitely better to have such a one than break up without fixing on some form of government which i believe at one time it was expected they would have done one of the outstanding characteristics of the members of the federal convention was their practical sagacity they had a very definite object before them no matter how much the members might talk about democracy in theory or about ancient confederacies when it came to action they did not go outside of their own experience 
the constitution was devised to correct well-known defects and it contained few provisions which had not been tested by practical political experience before the convention met some of the leading men in the country had prepared lists of the defects which existed in the articles of confederation and in the constitution practically every one of these defects was corrected and by means which had already been tested in the states and under the articles of confederation End of chapter seven chapter eight of the fathers of the constitution by max ferrand this librivox recording is in the public domain the union established the course of english history shows that anglo-saxon tradition is strongly in favour of observing precedents and of trying to maintain at least the form of law even in revolutions when the english people found it impossible to bear with james the second and made it so uncomfortable for him that he fled the country they shifted the responsibility from their own shoulders by charging him with breaking the original contract between king and people when the thirteen colonies had reached the point where they felt that they must separate from england their spokesman thomas jefferson found the necessary justification in the fundamental compact of the first settlers in the wilds of america where the emigrants thought proper to adopt that system of laws under which they had hitherto lived in the mother country and in the declaration of independence he charged the king of great britain with repeated injuries and usurpations all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states and so it was with the change to the new form of government in the united states which was accomplished only by disregarding the forms prescribed in the articles of confederation and has been called therefore the revolution of seventeen eighty nine from the outset the new constitution was placed under the sanction of the old the movement began with an attempt outwardly at least to revise the articles of confederation and in that form was authorized by congress the first breach with the past was made when the proposal in the virginia resolutions was accepted that amendments made by the convention in the articles of confederation should be submitted to assemblies chosen by the people instead of to the legislatures of the separate states this was the more readily accepted because it was believed that ratification by the legislatures would result in the formation of a treaty rather than in a working instrument of government the next step was to prevent the work of the convention from meeting the fate of all previous amendments to the articles of confederation which had required the consent of every state in the union at the time the committee of detail made its report the convention was ready to agree that the consent of all the states was not necessary and it eventually decided that when ratified by the conventions of nine states the constitution should go into effect between the states so ratifying it was not within the province of the convention to determine what the course of procedure should be in the individual states so it simply transmitted the constitution to congress and in an accompanying document which significantly omitted any request for the approval of congress strongly expressed the opinion that the constitution should be submitted to a convention of delegates chosen in each state by the people thereof this was nothing less than indirect ratification by the people and since it was impossible to foretell in advance which of the states would or would not ratify the original draft of we the people of the states of new hampshire massachusetts rhode island was changed to the phrase we the people of the united states no man of that day could imagine how significant this change would appear in the light of later history congress did not receive the new constitution enthusiastically yet after a few days discussion it unanimously voted eleven states being present that the recommendations of the convention should be followed and accordingly sent the document to the states but without a word of approval or disapproval on the whole the document was well received especially as it was favored by the upper class who had the ability and the opportunity for expression and were in a position to make themselves heard for a time it looked as if the constitution would be readily adopted the contest over the constitution in the states is usually taken as marking the beginning of the two great national political parties 
in the united states this was indeed in a way the first great national question that could cause such a division there had been to be sure whigs and tories in america reproducing british parties but when the trouble with the mother country began the successive congresses of delegates were recognized and attended only by the so-called american whigs and after the declaration of independence the name of tory became a reproach so that with the end of the war the tory party disappeared after the revolution there were local parties in the various states divided on one and another question such as that of hard and soft money and these issues had coincided in different states but they were in no sense national parties with organizations platforms and leaders they were purely local and the followers of one or the other would have denied that they were anything else than whigs but a new issue was now raised the whig party split in two new leaders appeared and the elements gathered in two main divisions the federalists advocating and the anti-federalists opposing the adoption of the new constitution there were differences of opinion over all the questions which had led to the calling of the federal convention and the framing of the constitution and so there was inevitably a division upon the result of the convention's work there were those who wanted national authority for the suppression of disorder and of what threatened to be anarchy throughout the union and on the other hand there were those who opposed a strongly organized government through fear of its destroying liberty especially debtors and creditors took opposite sides and most of the people in the united states could have been brought under one or the other category the former favored a system of government and legislation which would tend to relieve or postpone the payment of debts and as that relief would come more readily from the state governments they were naturally the friends of state rights and state authority and were opposed to any enlargement of the powers of the federal government on the other hand were those who felt the necessity of preserving inviolate every private and public obligation and who saw that the separate power of the states could not accomplish what was necessary to sustain both public and private credit they were disposed to use the resources of the union and accordingly to favor the strengthening of the national government in nearly every state there was a struggle between these classes in philadelphia and the neighborhood there was great enthusiasm for the new constitution almost simultaneously with the action by congress and before notification of it had been received a motion was introduced in the pennsylvania assembly to call a ratifying convention the anti-federalists were surprised by the suddenness of this proposal and to prevent action absented themselves from the session of the assembly leaving that body too short of the necessary quorum for the transaction of business the excitement and indignation in the city were so great that early the next morning a crowd gathered dragged two of the absentees from their lodgings to the state house and held them firmly in their places until the roll was called and a quorum counted when the house proceeded to order a state convention as soon as the news of this vote got out the city gave itself up to celebrating the event by the suspension of business the ringing of church bells and other demonstrations the elections were hotly contested but the federalists were generally successful the convention met towards the end of november and after three weeks of futile discussion mainly upon trivial matters and the meaning of words ratified the constitution on the twelfth of december by a vote of forty six to twenty three again the city of philadelphia celebrated pennsylvania was the first state to call a convention but its final action was anticipated by delaware where the state convention met and ratified the constitution by unanimous vote on the seventh of december the new jersey convention spent only a week in discussion and then voted also unanimously for ratification on the eighteenth of december the next day to ratify was georgia where the constitution was approved without a dissenting vote on january two seventeen eighty eight connecticut followed immediately and after a session of only five days declared itself in favor of the constitution on the ninth of january by a vote of over three to one the results of the campaign for ratification thus far were most gratifying to the federalists but the issue was not decided with the exception of pennsylvania the states which had acted were of lesser importance and until massachusetts new york and virginia should declare themselves the outcome would be in doubt the convention of massachusetts met on the same day that the connecticut convention adjourned the sentiment of boston like that of philadelphia was strongly federalist but the outlying districts and in particular the western part of the state where shays rebellion had broken out were to be counted in the opposition there were three hundred and fifty five delegates who took part in the massachusetts convention a larger number than was chosen in any of the other states and the majority seemed to be opposed to ratification 
the division was close however and it was believed that the attitude of two men would determine the result one of these was governor john hancock who was chosen chairman of the convention but who did not attend the sessions at the outset as he was confined to his house by an attack of gout which it was maliciously said would disappear as soon as it was known which way the majority of the convention would vote the other was samuel adams a genuine friend of liberty who was opposed on principle to the general theory of the government set forth in the constitution i stumble at the threshold he wrote i meet with a national government instead of a federal union of sovereign states for being a shrewd politician adams did not commit himself openly and when the tradesmen of boston declared themselves in favor of ratification he was ready to yield his personal opinion there were many delegates in the massachusetts convention who felt that it was better to amend the document before them than to try another federal convention when as good an instrument might not be devised if this group were added to those who were ready to accept the constitution as it stood they would make a majority in favor of the new government but the delay involved in amending was regarded as dangerous and it was argued that as the constitution made ample provision for changes it would be safer and wiser to rely upon that method the question was one therefore of immediate or future amendment pressure was accordingly brought to bear upon governor hancock and intimations were made to him of future political preferment until he was persuaded to propose immediate ratification of the constitution with an urgent recommendation of such amendments as would remove the objections of the massachusetts people when this proposal was approved by adams its success was assured and a few days later on the sixth of february the convention voted one hundred and eighty seven to one hundred and sixty eight in favor of ratification nine amendments largely in the nature of a bill of rights were then demanded and the massachusetts representatives in congress were enjoined at all times to exert all their influence and use all reasonable and legal methods to obtain a ratification of the said alterations and provisions on the very day this action was taken jefferson wrote from paris to madison i wish with all my soul that the nine first conventions may except the new constitution to secure to us the good it contains but i equally wish that the four latest whichever they may be may refuse to accede to it till a declaration of rights be annexed boston proceeded to celebrate as philadelphia and benjamin lincoln wrote to washington on the ninth of february enclosing an extract from the local paper describing the event by the paper your excellency will observe some account of the parade of the eighth the printer had by no means time enough to do justice to the subject to give you some idea how far he has been deficient i will mention an observation i heard made by a lady the last evening who saw the whole that the description in the paper would no more compare with the original than the light of the faintest star would with that of the sun fortunately for us the whole ended without the least disorder and the town during the whole evening was so far as i could observe perfectly quiet he added another paragraph which he later struck out as being of little importance but it throws an interesting sidelight upon the customs of the time the gentlemen provided at funeral hall some biscuit and cheese four quart casks of wine three barrels and two hogs of punch the moment they found that the people had drank sufficiently means were taken to overset the two hogs punch this being done the company dispersed and the day ended most agreeably maryland came next when the federal convention was breaking up luther martin was speaking of the new system of government to his colleague daniel of st thomas jennifer and exclaimed i'll be hanged if ever the people of maryland agree to it to which his colleague retorted i advise you to stay in philadelphia lest you should be hanged and jennifer proved to be right for in maryland the federalists obtained control of the convention and by a vote of sixty-three to eleven ratified the constitution on the twenty-sixth of april in south carolina which was the southern state next in importance to virginia the compromise on the slave trade proved to be one of the deciding factors in determining public opinion when the elections were held they resulted in an overwhelming majority for the federalists so that after a session of less than two weeks the convention ratified the constitution on the twenty eighth of may by a vote of over two to one the only apparent setback which the adoption of the constitution had thus far received was in new hampshire where the convention met early in february and then adjourned until june to see what the other states might do but this delay proved to be of no consequence for when the time came for the second meeting of the new hampshire delegates eight states had already acted favorably and adoption was regarded as a certainty this was sufficient to put a stop to any further waiting and new hampshire added its name to the list on the twenty first of june but the division of opinion was fairly well represented by the smallness of the majority the vote standing fifty seven to forty six
nine states had now ratified the constitution and it was to go into effect among them but the support of virginia and new york was of so much importance that their decisions were awaited with uneasiness in virginia in spite of the support of such men as washington and madison the sentiment for and against the constitution was fairly evenly divided and the opposition numbered in its ranks other names of almost equal influence such as patrick henry and george mason feeling ran high the contest was a bitter one and even after the elections had been held and the convention had opened early in june the decision was in doubt and remained in doubt until the very end the situation was in one respect at least similar to that which had existed in massachusetts in that it was possible to get a substantial majority in favor of the constitution provided certain amendments were made the same arguments were used strengthened on the one side by what other states had done and on the other side by the plea that now was the time to hold out for amendments the example of massachusetts however seems to have been decisive and on the twenty fifth of june four days later than new hampshire the virginia convention voted to ratify under the conviction that whatsoever imperfections may exist in the constitution ought rather to be examined in the mode prescribed therein than to bring the union into danger by delay with the hope of obtaining amendments previous to the ratification when the new york convention began its sessions on the seventeenth of june it is said that more than two-thirds of the delegates were anti-federalist in sentiment how a majority in favor of the constitution was obtained has never been adequately explained but it is certain that the main credit for the achievement belongs to alexander hamilton he had early realized how greatly it would help the prospects of the constitution if thinking people could be brought to an appreciation of the importance and value of the new form of government in order to reach the intelligent public everywhere but particularly in new york he projected a series of essays which should be published in the newspapers setting forth the aims and purposes of the constitution he secured the assistance of madison and jay and before the end of october seventeen eighty seven published the first essay in the independent Gaz gazetteer from that time on these papers continued to be printed over the signature of publius sometimes as many as three or four in a week there were eighty-five numbers altogether which have ever since been known as the federalist of these approximately fifty were the work of hamilton madison wrote about thirty and j five although the essays were widely copied in other journals and form for us the most important commentary on the constitution making what is regarded as one of america's greatest books it is doubtful how much immediate influence they had certainly in the new york convention itself hamilton's personal influence was a stronger force his arguments were both eloquent and cogent and met every objection and his efforts to win over the opposition were unremitting the news which came by express writers from new hampshire and then from virginia were also deciding factors for new york could not afford to remain out of the new union if it was to embrace states on either side and yet the debate continued as the opposition was putting forth every effort to make ratification conditional upon certain amendments being adopted but hamilton resolutely refused to make any concessions and at length was successful in persuading the new york convention by a vote of thirty against twenty seven on the twenty sixth of july to follow the example of massachusetts and virginia and to ratify the constitution with merely a recommendation of future amendments the satisfaction of the country at the outcome of the long and momentous struggle over the adoption of the new government was unmistakable even before the action of new york had been taken the fourth of july was made the occasion for a great celebration throughout the united states both as the anniversary of independence and as the consummation of the union by the adoption of the constitution the general rejoicing was somewhat tempered however by the reluctance of north carolina and rhode island to come under the new roof had the convention been met on the twenty first of july in north carolina reached a vote it would probably have defeated the constitution but it was doubtless restrained by the action of new york and adjourned without coming to a decision a second convention was called in september seventeen eighty nine and in the meantime the new government had come into operation and was bringing pressure to bear upon the recalcitrant states which refused to abandon the old union for the new one of the earliest acts passed by congress was a revenue act levying duties upon foreign goods imported which were made specifically to apply to imports from rhode island and north carolina this was sufficient for north carolina and on november twenty one seventeen eighty nine the convention ratified the constitution but rhode island still held out the convention of that state was finally called to meet in march seventeen ninety but accomplished nothing and avoided a decision by adjourning until may the federal government then proceeded to threaten drastic measures by taking up a bill which authorized the president to suspend all commercial intercourse with rhode island 
and to demand of that state the payment of its share of the federal debt the bill passed the senate but stopped there for the state gave in and ratified the constitution on the twenty ninth of may two weeks later ellsworth who was now united states senator from connecticut wrote that rhode island had been brought into the union and by a pretty cold measure in congress which would have exposed me to some censure had it not produced the effect which i expected it would and which in fact it has done but all is well that ends well the constitution is now adopted by all the states and i have much satisfaction and perhaps some vanity in seeing at length a great work finished for which i have long labored incessantly perhaps the most striking feature of these conventions is the trivial character of the objections that were raised some of the arguments it is true went to the very heart of the matter and considered the fundamental principles of government it is possible to tolerate and even to sympathize with a man who declared among other deformities the constitution has an awful squinting it squints toward monarchy your president may easily become a king if your american chief be a man of ambition and ability how easy it is for him to render himself absolute we shall have a king the army will salute him monarch but it is hard to take seriously a delegate who asked permission to make a short apostrophe to liberty and then delivered himself of this bathos o oh, liberty thou greatest good thou fairest property with thee i wish to live with thee i wish to die pardon me if i drop a tear on the peril to which she is exposed i cannot sir see this brightest of jewels tarnished a jewel worth ten thousand worlds and shall we part with it so soon oh no there might be some reason in objecting to the excessive power vested in congress but what is one to think of the fear that imagined the greatest point of danger to lie in the ten miles square which later became the district of columbia because the government might erect a fortified stronghold which would be invincible again in the light of subsequent events it is laughable to find many protesting that although each house was required to keep a journal of proceedings it was only required from time to time to publish the same excepting such parts as may in their judgment require secrecy all sorts of personal charges were made against those who were responsible for the framing of the constitution hopkinson wrote to jefferson in april seventeen eighty eight you will be surprised when i tell you that our public newspapers have announced general washington to be a fool influenced and led by that knave dr franklin who is a public defaulter for millions of dollars that mr morris has defrauded the public out of as many millions as you please and that they are to cover their frauds by this new government all things considered it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that such critics and detractors were trying to find excuses for their opposition the majorities in the various conventions can hardly be said really to represent the people of their states for only a small percentage of the people had voted in electing them they were representative rather of the propertied upper class this circumstance has given rise to the charge that the constitution was framed and adopted by men who were interested in the protection of property in the maintenance of the value of government securities and in the payment of debts which had been incurred by the individual states in the course of the revolution property holders were unquestionably assisted by the mere establishment of a strong government the creditor class seemed to require some special provision and when the powers of congress were under consideration in the federal convention several of the members argued strongly for a positive injunction on congress to assume obligations of the states the chief objection to this procedure seemed to be based upon the fear of benefiting speculators rather than the legitimate creditors and the matter was finally compromised by providing that all debts should be as valid against the united states under this constitution as under the confederation the charge that the constitution was framed and its adoption obtained by men of property and wealth is undoubtedly true but it is a mistake to attribute unworthy motives to them the upper classes in the united states were generally people of wealth and so would be the natural holders of government securities they were undoubtedly acting in self-protection but the responsibility rested upon them to take the lead they were acting indeed for the public interest in the largest sense for conditions in the united states were such that every man might become a landowner and the people in general therefore wished to have property rights protected in the autumn of seventeen eighty eight the congress of the old confederation made testamentary provision for its heir by voting that presidential electors should be chosen on the first wednesday in january seventeen eighty nine that these electors should meet and cast their votes for president on the first wednesday in february and that the senate and house of representatives should assemble on the first wednesday in march it was also decided that the seat of government should be in the city of new york until otherwise ordered by congress in accordance with this procedure the requisite elections were held 
and the new government was duly installed it happened in seventeen eighty nine that the first wednesday in march was the fourth day of that month which thereby became the date for the beginning of each subsequent administration the acid test of efficiency was still to be applied to the new machinery of government but americans then as now were an adaptable people with political genius and they would have been able to make almost any form of government succeed if the federal convention had never met there is good reason for believing that the articles of confederation with some amendments would have been made to work the success of the new government was therefore in a large measure dependent upon the favor of the people if they wished to do so they could make it win out in spite of obstacles in other words the new government would succeed exactly to the extent to which the people stood back of it this was the critical moment when the slowly growing prosperity described at length and emphasized in the previous chapters produced one of its most important effects in june seventeen eighty eight washington wrote to lafayette i expect that many blessings will be attributed to our new government which are now taking their rise from that industry and frugality into the practice of which the people have been forced from necessity i really believe that there never was so much labor and economy to be found before in the country as at the present moment if they persist in the habits they are acquiring the good effects will soon be distinguishable when the people shall find themselves secure under an energetic government when foreign nations shall be disposed to give us equal advantages in commerce from dread of retaliation when the burdens of the war shall be in a manner done away by the sale of western lands when the seeds of happiness which are sown here shall begin to expand themselves and when every one under his own vine and fig tree shall begin to taste the fruits of freedom then all these blessings for all these blessings will come will be referred to the fostering influence of the new government whereas many causes will have conspired to produce them a few months later a similar opinion was expressed by crevecoeur in writing to jefferson never was so great a change in the opinion of the best people as has happened these five years almost everybody feels the necessity of coercive laws government union industry and labor the exports of this country have singularly increased within these two years and the imports have decreased in proportion the new federal government was fortunate in beginning its career at the moment when returning prosperity was predisposing the people to think well of it the inauguration of washington marked the opening of a new era for the people of the united states of america end of chapter eight end of the fathers of the constitution by max ferrand